Welcome to Scary Stories and Ambient Rain. This video was designed for people who want to relax or sleep while listening to some scary stories. For those of you who are new, I know that may sound like a weird combination, but give it a shot. It might be exactly what you've been looking for. Now, before we begin, I have to talk about the sponsor of this video, and this is going to sound odd. Yes, that is cheese on the screen. Why? Why is there cheese on the screen? Well, in addition to being scared, I also manage the chilling platform that some of you may know of, as well as give tours in person of the actual original Scream House featured at the end of the 1996 slasher movie, Scream. That is the house that I'm standing in front of in the picture that you can see on the screen. I do the tours in person every few months, and since I started doing the tours, the owner of the Scream House and I have become good friends. And in addition to owning the iconic Scream House, he also owns the Petaluma Creamery in Petaluma, California. And that's why there's cheese on the screen. I'm doing a very special promotion for my friend, and this is the biggest promotion I have ever done on this channel. This is my brand new limited edition Being Scared Scream House merch, and I'm going to be choosing 50 people in the month of December to send this stuff to. If you win, you can choose a shirt, a hoodie, or a regular sweater. And get this, 25 of you will also receive this autographed Being Scared Becoming poster, in addition to the new merch items that I just showed you. These are extremely limited edition posters, and I do not have that many left. And lastly, this is the ultimate. I'm going to be choosing five people, only five, to give two tickets to my Scream House tours. You can use the tickets to go to any future tours that you want. You can go by yourself, or you can bring a friend or a family member. You can meet me in person. You can tour the house that was featured at the end of the movie Scream, and be given exclusive and incredibly limited edition stuff at the house. All you have to do to win is go to springhillcheese.com forward slash shop and use the discount code being scared at checkout for 15% off your order. You can buy any cheese you want and as much of it as you want to qualify. But make sure that you use the promo code being scared or you will not be eligible to win. I have tried all this cheese and I'm not kidding when I tell you it's the best cheese I've ever had especially the garlic jack. One time my wife made grilled cheese sandwiches with it, and I've been having dreams about them ever since. So again, if you want to win this limited edition stuff, just go buy some cheese and use the promo code being scared. The coolest part about all this, this promotion doesn't end. I will be choosing people every single month in 2024 to send some of this exclusive stuff to. If you go support the owner of the Scream House and my very good friend and buy some cheese, you can win. Thank you for sticking around for this very long intro, and I promise it's not a normal thing here. If you have any questions about this giveaway, post them in the comments and I will respond. See the video description for step-by-step -step instructions on how to win. Last thing. Please remember that on this channel, I always put minimal ads in my videos, and that's the way it'll always be. In this video, there are only three ads after the first three stories. The rest of the video will be smooth sailing. Now, let's begin. The stranger was walking down the quiet rural street, dressed in a suit and tie. It was midnight. I had just gotten home from a night out with my friends when I saw the stranger shuffling past my house. Hey, buddy, you all right? I hollered from the front porch. The stranger ignored me and kept walking. 
I briefly considered shrugging off the oddity and heading indoors, but I could not shake the feeling that something was wrong. I know most of the people who live along the road. Some are even relatives, so I couldn't, in good conscience, ignore my gut. I climbed back into my car, thinking it would be a good barrier between the stranger and me if he were to try anything, and took off in pursuit. He hadn't gotten far when I rolled up to him, cracking the passenger window, and asked, Are you okay? The stranger was drenched in sweat and staring distantly through fogged glasses. He looked to be in his early forties, maybe younger. Sir, I said, did your car break down somewhere? Without looking at me, the man quietly answered, No. Are you staying nearby? There was a momentary pause, followed by another quiet, No. I kept my car rolling at the stranger's pace, observing his shaking hands. He appeared anxious, whether that was because of me or something else, I do not know, but his behavior did nothing but give further cause for concern. Do you need me to call someone? No. I watched him quietly for another moment, then asked him something that every fiber in me opposed. Do you need a ride? The man stopped walking. I pressed on the brakes and came to a halt beside him. He stood silent, his chest puffing in and out with each breath, then turned only his head and said, No. He turned his gaze back to the road ahead and continued walking. I did not follow. To put my mind at ease, I hurried back past my place and over to my cousin's. She lives only three houses down from me. Usually, she and her family are in bed around ten or so, but this time, I was surprised to find that the lights were still on. I went up to the door and knocked a couple of times. Her husband, Dan, carefully cracked the door, saw that it was me, then relaxed. Hey, Scott. Hey, Dan. I said, looking at the shotgun hanging by his side. Something got you spooked? Dan sighed. A little. Come on in. I stepped inside. Where's Katie? I'm right here. Katie whispered as she crept out of the kids' room and quietly shut the door. What are you doing here so late? Well... I scratched the back of my head. There's a guy dressed in a suit and tie walking down the road and acting kind of strange. Came from this way. I just wanted to make sure everyone was okay. Dan and Katie exchanged glances. Then Katie said, I think he might have been over here earlier. What do you mean? I was in the backyard with the dogs, letting them do their business before bed, when I heard whistling. Whistling? Yeah, like a person whistling a tune. I glanced over at Dan, and he nodded. You know, we got that fence back there now so that the dogs don't wander off and so I couldn't see anyone, but I could hear that they were moving right along the perimeter of the fence. A chill ran through me. Did the dogs freak out? That's the weirdest part. They didn't. They bark at just about anything, and any other time but this time they just continued sniffing the grass like the whistling wasn't even happening. What did you do? I ran inside and told Dan, and he went outside and looked. Searched the whole yard and didn't see anybody, Dan added. Did you check the road? Yep. Walked down to the end of the driveway and looked both ways. Nothing. Think it might have been a bird? Katie shook her head. No way. This was a person. Maybe we should call the cops. Katie and Dan agreed, and Dan pulled out his cell phone and called 911. We gave the dispatcher the stranger's description, and they told us they would send a unit to check it out. I'm going to get in my car and see if I can find him, I said after Dan hung up. Don't do anything stupid, Scott, Katie begged. I'm not. I just want to get eyes on him. I headed over to the door, and Katie stopped me. Why don't you stay here tonight? 
I turned and smiled. I'll be all right. Plus, I've got to go let the dog out. Bring him over here with you. I hugged Katie and stepped out to the car. I'll call you when I see him. Katie didn't argue any further and waved goodbye like I had taken her heart and wouldn't be bringing it back anytime soon. Once I reached my house, I once again continued past in search of the stranger. It was reasonable to assume he'd be well down the road by then, but I ended up driving much further than he would have gotten on foot without even finding the slightest hint of him. Instead, I found the deputy. I slowed down next to his car and rolled down my window. A mustached deputy looked back at me. I told him that we had been the ones who had called and the stranger didn't seem to be on the road anymore. The deputy said he'd keep looking and then we parted ways. Wasn't much else for me to do but go home, so I did just that. I pulled up the gravel driveway, shut off the car, and headed inside. Opening the door spooked the dog. It usually does, but his barking subsided when I flicked on the lights. Hey, boy, I said, petting him. I held the door open and let him run outside to wet the grass. I stood beneath the starlit sky, watching the dog sniff the earth, when I heard a whistling tune come from behind the house. It carried through the air like a windswept song, but this was a night when the trees were still and there wasn't a breeze to be felt. The melody became clearer and floated around the house, seemingly to my side. It was indiscernibly human and the dog did not bark. I hurried the dog inside, grabbed a baseball bat I keep by the door, and went around the house, tense and ready to swing. Every shadow seemed a trespasser that night. Every falling branch and rustling leaf, every hooting owl and chirping cricket, hopping rabbit and creeping raccoon. But none of it was the stranger in the suit. I had called Katie after I heard the whistle and told her as much. I said that the deputy was out looking, but by morning, it became clear that the stranger was never found. And that was that. Or so we thought. Mr. Weston lived two houses down from me, and for as long as I can remember, had been a paraplegic, wheelchair-bound and all alone. Mr. Weston was the last person you'd expect to hang himself, but two days after we had heard the whistling, Mr. Weston was found hanging from a tree behind his house that he undoubtedly could not have reached on his own. Detectives said he looked like he had been hanging there for a couple of days. It doesn't end there. Two houses down from Mr. Weston's place lived a young man and his wife. They are both healthy as could be, and both are Coast Guard veterans, spent a lot of time in the water, and despite all that, they were found dead in their bathtub the day after Mr. Weston was found hanging from a tree. Drowned. And maybe you guessed, but from the looks of it, they had been in there for about three days. There's a commonality we discovered since then. Of those of us along the road who are still living, Someone in their household heard the whistling that night. They heard it, they investigated, and they found nothing. Could it be that the three who died never heard the whistling? I don't sleep well anymore. Too afraid I will miss the whistling tune. A whistle no dog hears. A warning they cannot give.
In 1999, I was in my mid-40s and I had just escaped from my stressful and joyless career as a management consultant. I needed a project. I loved small period buildings and decided to throw my energy into restoring one. I started combing through auction catalogs in search of a place. Having failed to win a number of London houses that didn't much inspire me anyway, I cast the net wider. My father would often give me advice over the phone. He persuaded me to focus on Derbyshire, a county my family has a strong connection to, and helped me identify what my ideal house would be like. Stone built, a south-facing garden with at least two bedrooms and a workshop. One night, we had just finished a long conversation about this elusive dream home when Dad, a healthy 75-year-old, had a heart attack. He died instantly. I didn't look at any more auction catalogs until after the funeral. When I did, I spotted Lowe's Cottage straight away. Located in the Derbyshire Dales village of Upper Mayfield, it was built late in the 18th century by a stonemason who needed a home with a workshop. It seemed exactly like the place my father had described. I drove out to view it the day before the auction. The cottage was approached over the ominously titled Hanging Bridge and Gallows Tree Lane. The house itself was named after a nearby Iron Age burial mound. Perhaps I should have felt a sense of foreboding, especially when the agent would not let me use my video camera inside the house. But the cottage had everything I had been looking for, with the added attraction of bewitching Peak District views. I was delighted by it. The following day, I turned up at the auction to find a camera crew present and a tangible buzz in the room. The hammer came down after I had bid 6000 over the guide price. I would barely had time to process the fact that I had won before I was ushered into an anteroom full of reporters. A microphone was thrust towards me and someone asked, How does it feel to have bought England's most haunted cottage? I had no idea of the house's reputation. There was no hint of it in the description, but I was quickly brought up to speed. A couple, Andrew and Josie Smith, who had bought Lowe's Cottage in 1994, had filed a lawsuit against the previous owners for not telling them the property was haunted. The Smiths claimed that they had been driven out by a number of manifestations, including something they described as a creeping presence, like a mist that appeared and thickened into fog. They spoke of sudden pockets of cold, damp patches on the wall and objects inexplicably moving. Their claims were backed up by a vicar who investigated the cottage and said that he found a pungent odor that moved around and a wall that seemed to weep when he placed his hand on it. It was reported to be the first case relying on the existence of supernatural forces since the Middle Ages, but the judge gave the Smith's claims short shrift. During my first night in Lowe's Cottage, I started to have some sympathy for my predecessors. My collie, Sion, was uneasy entering the house and found it hard to settle. Lights switched on and off. There were sudden changes in temperature, and my TV would turn itself on. There were further incidents. I was visited by reporters who experienced problems with tape recorders or cameras. I remembered the agent who had forbidden filming when I first visited, and when mysterious patches of glistening moisture started forming on the walls, I recalled the vicar's description of a weeping wall. It felt almost as if Lowe's Cottage had a personality and was testing me in some way. The place seemed capable of changing moods, though I never had any sense of a malignant entity. I later got to meet the Smiths and found them to be solid and authentic people. After a while, Sion seemed to make peace with the house, and the perplexing incidents stopped. I spent a happy four years at the cottage before renting it out. Only one of the tenants has reported anything unusual. 
In the months after the auction, some people told me the house would be a blessing to me. And they were right. In spite of its notoriety, I'm very grateful to Lowe's Cottage. Seemingly prophesized by my father, it acted as a pivot between an unhappy time in my life and my more fulfilling existence, restoring period properties. Before I start the story, I should probably give context so you can fully understand the layout of my friend's house and why I was staying there. At this time, I was in the Navy and was about to leave for deployment. I had just moved out of my apartment and moved my things into my storage. My friends were kind enough to make arrangements for me to stay with them before we headed out to sea. Their house was on a corner at the entrance of the neighborhood. It was in a busy street with a gas station directly across the house. The driveway was right off the busy street, but the front door faced away from the road. You actually couldn't see it unless you took a path that would wind around a large tree and a few bushes. Basically, it was tucked away, and sometimes delivery drivers would need help finding it if we ordered pizza or something. This is important because at night, it's especially hard to find. There was a camera on the garage and another at the front door. My friend Jay and I had started a routine where we would sit on the couch, drink wine, and watch true crime. It was our way of winding down from the day. This particular night was one of those nights. Jay and I were sitting on the couch when we heard the ring doorbell go off. Jay and I looked at each other a little puzzled because it was very late. That's weird. Did you order food or something? I asked Jay. No, did you? She asked me as she opened up her phone to look at the app to see who was out front. I began to walk over to the door to see if it was our neighbors or someone who might need help. Don't open the door, Jay said. I could hear fear in her voice. I turned, looking at her concerned and a bit confused. I walked over to Jay and looked over her shoulder at her phone to see what was scaring her. My stomach dropped. A large man was standing at our front door completely still. He was wearing a mask and holding what looked like a child's backpack that appeared to be dirty and stained. What are you doing? Jay asked through the screen. The man held up the backpack and opened it slightly. He tilted it trying to show us what was in the bag, but we couldn't see. If you have a ring camera, then you probably know that sometimes the quality can be crap. But a glare made it seem like something shiny was in the bag, yet the man never pulled it out. He then got close to the camera and just stared right into it. It was creepy. He stayed there just staring. His eyes were dead and looked sinister. Did I say creepy? No. It was terrifying. I'm calling the cops. I yelled. I grabbed my keys and also made my car alarm go off to scare the man away and bring attention to anyone nearby. It seemed to work because the man slowly walked away. I called 911 as Jay monitored the cameras for any sign of the man. Once I got off the phone with dispatch, Jay showed me something even more terrifying. The cameras caught footage of the man sneaking around the house prior to him ringing the doorbell. He was trying to understand the layout of our house. The footage also showed him pressing his back against the side of the house and looking around the corner a few times, as if he was making sure no one was around to see what he was doing. It was then that I made the connection that he was probably planning to hurt us with whatever was in that bag. The cops came and we gave our statements and the footage from the doorbell camera. 
They let us know that they would keep an eye out for the man matching the description and let us know of any updates. But the story does not end here. A few weeks passed since the incident with the man. I had pretty much forgotten about the whole thing until I got a call. A police officer reached out to me and asked me to sit down because she had an update about the man we saw. Approximately 12 minutes before the man came to our house, he had broken into an elderly woman's home. He stood in her bedroom and was watching her sleep until the woman woke up and saw him. She screamed, and he stabbed her seven times before fleeing. The man had thought that he killed the woman, but she somehow survived. The only reason we know it was the same man was because the elderly woman also had a doorbell camera showing the same man with the same mask and the child's backpack. Remember the stains I said were on the bag? It was the woman's blood. The footage we gave the cops was used in a trial and the man was put in prison from what I heard. I am really thankful Jay stopped me from opening that door. Who knows what would have happened if I had. And thank God for doorbell cameras. It was quite a beautiful night when all this happened. I had been working at a hostel in Arkansas, and I had met a German national named Amelia. We became a thing rather quickly, and spent our nights searching and exploring the city streets, and enjoying the lamplights in their orange glow, laughing and joking, and kissing and hugging, all that sort of stuff. It was in October, a few nights before Halloween, and we were on one of our typical nightly escapades. I remember that the moon was bright. I cannot quite recall if it was full or not, but I know that it was light enough to witness all of our surroundings. There was this spot called Foster Pond, and her and I frequented a specific bench that seemed to never be occupied, almost as if it were only for us. Her and I sat there, gazing up towards the stars, listening to the trickles of pond water, enjoying the strange scenery of the town around us. We felt untouched and unburdened. She and I made plans to visit Germany next year and celebrate Oktoberfest together. It was an innocent time, really. After a while, Emilia leaned her head back more and more and stared up towards the constellations and I fixated my eyes out towards the pond and the area that enveloped it. At first, it was just movement, motion, a lone figure walking down the path, not unusual at midnight in this particular part of town. However, something grabbed at me in my slim-to-nothing attention span about this particular wayward walker. The walk was deliberate, methodical, angry and fast. The first impression I had was that this guy really had something going on. Perhaps it was a Halloween party, or perhaps he had just been relieved from work and just wanted to get some. Something about the gate really got my attention, and I could not stop fixating on this man, just charging through the park in a mad dashery sort of way. Within a few seconds, it sprung on me why I was so fixated on the guy. It was what was in his right hand. It was a hatchet. Definitely a hatchet. Now, my first thought was, Ah, cool, a Halloween costume. Hatchet-wielding psycho. Well done, sir, well done. But another few seconds passed by and I thought to myself, Maybe not. Upon further inspection, it appeared as if he wasn't really in a costume, and it did not seem to be a mere prop. To be clad in nothing but shorts and a hoodie, 
whilst wielding a hatchet would not be inappropriate for Halloween. I had to remind myself that it was not quite Halloween yet. In fact, it was two days before Halloween. This was no costume, and that hatchet was no mere prop. It dawned on me in the dark that this was straight up a guy walking across the park with a hatchet and coming straight at Amelia and myself. At the moment, I wasn't quite sure as to what to do, but I figured it would be best to do something. Something like, get out of there. I turned to Amelia and whispered, Hey, don't worry about it, and please don't ask any questions yet, but just get up and let's go. Right now. Let's go back to the hostel. Now. Um, okay, she said. Fortunately for me, she didn't ask any questions or present any disagreements. She stood up off the bench, and I put my arm around hers, and we walked back towards the hostel while I said, Nothing's wrong. Keep it cool. I wanted her and I to walk as if we had not a care in the world, as if nothing was wrong. Okay, okay, she repeated over and over, as I felt myself nervously picking up the pace, while trying to seem chill and nonplussed. We got to the door of the hostel and I opened the door and made sure she went in first, and I followed, and then locked the door behind me. Tight. I peered out of the darkness out by the pond. What is it? Amelia asked. She knew something was up by now. What's wrong? Feeling safer behind locked doors, I felt a responsibility to inform her of the situation. But I didn't want to freak her out. For all I knew, I was the only person who was freaked out. But still, there's some guy out there with an axe, I said. A what? Amelia asked. Just look, I said. Just wait. Sure enough, the man with the hatchet came right up to the bench where Amelia and I had been sitting. He looked left. He looked right. Up, down, past him, behind, in front, all over. He even looked down on the ground and scoured the place. Then, this figure emitted the most terrifying scream I had ever witnessed escape a human body before. It was filled with torment and anguish and frustration. Behind closed, locked doors, the scream was loud enough to give me goosebumps. The hell? Emilia asked. After shaking his arms at the stars in the sky, as if the gods had wronged him, the figure with the hatchet sunk his hooded head down low and began to walk off back towards whence he came. We were safe, presumably. After reading the newspapers and talking to a few neighbors the day after, no information came. Nobody had known anything about this strange, solitary figure who paraded Foster Pond with a hatchet. I pray it was an isolated incident. Emilia and I never went to that pond after dark ever again. For just over 15 years, Berkingshire, England, in its bright and wondrous glory, was the breeding ground for joy and cheer. Every year, the denizens of the city gather around the center of the square to share the tales of the supernatural. Tales of goblins and elves, of wizards and witches, tales of heroism and valor. This particular holiday was known to them as Lore Night the one time of year where any patron, young and old, were invited to come from all countries and cultures in the world. Lore night always began upon the setting sun and would seldom end until the rising dawn. Of course, food and the best of the freshly brewed ale were always anticipated on this night. Freshly killed and optically prepared game 
accompanied by what would be compared to at least two full-grown fields of delicious crops. On a selected few occasions, it was said that there would even be music being played as the tales of the tales larger than life were being told. The best aspect of Lore Knight, according to most in Berkingshire, was when one storyteller would subtly attempt to weave their tale in such a way that would attempt to outdo the other tales being told that night. For example, two years back, a young lad captivated all in attendance beyond all others with his tale of a fierce and virtuous warrior that would conquer beasts and dragons alike for the protection of his kingdom. Another tale that was applauded above all others, one particular lore knight, was spoken by a Norwegian sailor who celebrated his own account of encountering and defending his vessel against the wrath of the damnable Draugr. Until tonight, this tale was considered to be incontestable in its popularity among the commoners in Berkingshire. This lore knight, however, would shift the very history of Berkingshire, forming an irrevocable crimson stain on its otherwise joyous visage. This year's lore night began like every year before it. The excited and anxious storytellers began to amass in the center of the city, where at least three cords of dry logs lay neatly prepared for the token bonfire that would blaze bright through the night's festivities. Long tables of food and drink were being prepared. The market clerk, who always ran the meat and produce stands, was, as always, had been from the prior years on this night, at the forefront of preparing the holiday feast. On this occasion, however, he was determined to make this year's lore night feast bigger and more gluttonous than any before, and any to come. The timbermen of Berkingshire began to double the size of the festive pyre as insurance for its continuous burning. It seemed that the commoners intended for this year's lore night to be the biggest and boldest of them all, as if it may be their last, and for many of them, this night would indeed be their very last. The setting sun saw the lighting of the festive pyre in the center of town. Many gasped in awe and excitement at the monumental height of the hungry, scorching flames, easily tripling the height and overall size of years before. At this, the masses hastily flocked to the tables adorned with the gratuitous feast. Indeed, the market clerk and those in his assistance had outdone themselves, for even upon the setting sun's last glimmer, many were still preoccupied with gorging themselves on the delectable meal and were unable to tell their tales they had prepared all year for on this night. That is, except for one man. This man declined silently to partake in the feast. No one saw him touch so much as even a single crumb from the bountiful buffet. One or two individuals approached him, attempting to extend warm invitations to join in on the bountiful banquet. The stranger answered these advances with only a cold, stoic, and malignant stare. Upon witnessing this behavior from the stranger, many in the congregated mass began to feel the slight chill crawl up their spines as they observed the stranger lingering near the festive bonfire, whose heat began to grow so immense as to be felt by all in the nearby vicinity. Even as the heat of the blaze intensified, however, the stranger wouldn't remove the long, dark, ashen-gray trench coat whose collar was erected upwards as to conceal his face, only exposing the eyes under the brim of his pitch-black, wide-brimmed hat. As he stood so close to the pyre that the congregation began to wonder what kept him from being set ablaze himself, the features of the strangers, or lack thereof, became more pronounced. The muted stranger's eyes were covered in red, raging veins, giving them an appearance not wholly dissimilar to a rabid animal. The irises were as devoid of hue as the trench coat that concealed his features from view. In the center, however, the stranger's pupils were somehow even darker than the night sky above itself, as if looking into them could cause one to be stripped of their soul in a matter of mere seconds. Despite the stranger's foreboding presence, the attending mass gathered around the towering inferno that was the festive pyre, as it was time for the night's tales to be told. However, despite the year's time spent preparing for this very moment, 
None in attendance could remember what stories they came to tell. None, that is, except for the stranger, whose gaze still fixed on the dance of the large flames before them all. So you've gathered here for stories, have you? Uttered a cracked, hoarse voice, as if the speech was performed under some sort of intense strain on the vocal cords. Though hoarse and strained words were, every individual ear had perceived them. There was a clear stance of absolute certainty in everyone's minds that the voice was indeed that of the stranger, who, until that very moment, remained distantly cold and completely mute. This sudden shift in the stranger's behavior caused the attending mass to take aback in shock. I will share a story with you all. A story to make you realize the mistake that you've all made and have made for a generation now. At this statement, a dreadful chill overtook the wind's breeze, causing the patrons to shiver, despite the ever-blazing inferno before them. This abrupt temperature change caused some to position themselves closer to the flames in a feeble attempt to find some semblance of warmth amid the suddenly chilling air, an attempt that proved futile, as if the very essence of the flames' natural heat had been taken away, leaving them to dance wildly about atop the festive pyre. This abrupt phenomena, coupled with the formerly mute and mysterious stranger's threatening and rather ominous statement, forced an air of unease and a jarring sense of dread to spread throughout the congregation. None of you believe in the entities in whose names you forge through the tales of fiction from effectively dishonoring the respect and fear they were once due. None of the patrons in the present mass knew how to comprehend the mysterious stranger's abrasive claims. Surely, they optimistically thought this facade is nothing except a mere act of a tactic for captivating the audience's attention. This was Lore Night, a night of fun and cheer in the regaling of folk legends of elder days and the tall tales molded by the tricks of eager imaginations, not the grim and macabre, as was implied by the stranger. The tale I tell you now is the story of my land from which I hail. Take special care to listen, for when suffering comes upon you all, you may then know in your beating hearts and your tortured souls the full extent of those who you and your mockeries have disgraced. This tale, the stranger began, remaining stiff as if he were a statue cut from marble or granite, with his unwaveringly menacing glare eternally fixed within the festive pyre's flames, begins with the priest of my native land, Father Durkenshaw. You see, the father was a good man, a righteous man. Holy as he was, the wills and righteous ways of the god blinded the good father to the dangerous arrogance of closing his mind to the powers beyond the grasp of even the heavenly father's might to contest. As the stranger continued his blasphemous macabre narration, a stench of decay and formaldehyde laced the air that was breathed by the congregated audience forcing more than many of them to begin to gag whilst others attempted the banquet they enjoyed profusely from being emptied from their stomachs. Father Durkenshaw, the stranger continued, had no tolerance for any such aspect of life that was not deemed as being of God's will. Much like you all, Father Durkenshaw was all too swift to brush away anything deemed not of holy merit as but mere illusions of deluded and perverted minds. The father conducted his life in this manner for many generations, blissfully ignorant of the forces that play beyond the sacred rites of the Christian faith. The flames began to shift color from the bright orange to an infernal red. All at once, the formerly lost heat returned twofold, forcing the patrons to profusely sweat. Beyond the mild physical discomfort, however, was an infernal terror that this, as well as the previous phenomena, must in some way or another be connected to the stranger. 
This collectively agreed upon conclusion was not voiced by any, however, to not draw any undesirable attention to themselves, as well as to feed their equally growing sense of morbid curiosity in hearing exactly where the stranger's story would go next. The stranger's eyes widened, further pronouncing their disturbing appearance. That is... He continued, his voice further distorting with each uttered word. Until the arrival of a conjurer whose very nature could and did challenge the will of the church. No one knows where he wandered from, as no one could remember any interaction with him. They hadn't even known of his name. The surrounding darkness outside of the immediate radius of the bonfire's light began to crawl inward close to the towering blaze, engulfing nearly all of the congregated patrons, leaving only a few to be spared from the shadows by the ever-raging fire's light. Whimpers of terrified anxiety rose amongst them as they began to lose sight of each other in the encroaching void, whilst the stranger, still illuminated in the glow of the blaze, continued regaling them of his ghostly testament. The stranger began to finally undo the buttons of his trench coat, though not quite yet enough to expose any of his features apart from his corpse-like eyes. You see, the conjurer wished to live in peace amongst the natives. The stranger continued, his cold, sinister gaze appearing to cause the flames to dance more viciously upon the festive pyre than before. But his hunger and conflicting practices forced him into a life of cold solitude. He would spend his days in a blissful hibernation and would walk the land under the moon's glow. That alone, while trivial and mysterious to the commoners, was not what caused them to shun him. It was his unnatural palate for living blood. It was at this very moment when the now-captivated mass began to perceive what they could only describe being the chilling laughter of a pack of hyenas who lost themselves to some sort of state of hysteria. Hearing these cackles, certain individuals found themselves grateful, in an odd sort of way, that the oppressive darkness that now nearly swallowed each and every individual had rendered them unable to see even so much as their hands in front of their faces lest they would be forced to envision whatever demonic beings that could produce such a noise. Despite the increasingly overwhelming urge to attempt a flight from the morbid phenomenon occurring in the city's center, none in the congregation could find within them the strength of will even to flee in fear. The stranger's ghoulish narrative continued, despite the infectiously spreading dread amongst the mass, who were now swallowed in entirety by the looming shadow. His taste, his lust for warm, fresh blood could never be sated, for such in the existence of one such as he, always craving, never enough. However, in spite of his ravenous nature, he wished only peace to the village folk. For many years, he would live off the blood of the livestock. One night, upon his awakening, the conjurer had spied upon a beautiful maiden, the most beautiful of any in the long recorded history of this lifetime to ever have and ever would walk these lands. The love birthed within him had not been felt since his conception into this earth. The manic howls from deep within the looming shadows became louder, growing closer and more pronounced much the same fashion as a flock of predators encircling their helpless victims, allowing the venomous fear to cripple mind and body before gorging themselves upon the fresh pound of flesh. Screams and shrieks of fright rang out into the ever-persisting darkness as glints of maliciously ravenous eyes shone as crimson as that of the rubies encrusted within the trinkets of the maiden's present in the horrific scene of unholy events. Having left with no conceivable alternative for escaping the menacing darkness and whatever malevolent evils within, the mass began to congregate as close to the blazing festive pyre as was physically possible, yet still taking great care to space away from the stranger, as if wandering too close to his presence, may see them afflicted by some nature of unsaintly power 
that he may supposedly possess. What be thy lordly given name, sir, from the distant lands beyond? She asked the mysterious conjurer. The stranger's narrative continued. To this, the conjurer spoke to her the very name that reigns the utmost supremacy in the land that I hail. I, my sweet delicate blossom, am Lord Vladimir Clavicolus of the Eastern Kingdoms. The stranger roared the name aloud, causing the blaze to flare in an angry burst, and the deranged howls and cackles within the consuming darkness to bark out into the open night, creeping ever closer to the center. As swiftly as his eyes could entrap hers, her heart succumbed to his lustful whims. Many a night following, the proud Lord Clavicolus would call her from her tower to meet him, purely for the consumption of her precious blood from her beautifully porcelain neck. It was said that Lord Clavicolus's bite filled the maiden's heart with further desire for him. For each night, she was said to have grown restless, impatient for her consort's return. At this, many within the congregation began to feel cold, petite hands softly caressing their bare flesh as the cackles within the consuming void continued to advance upon them. Soft, inane whispers were heard by each ear in the captive mass, almost appearing as sensual. The stranger, of whose damning glare never arrested from the ceaseless fury of the furious flames within the festive pyre, continued whilst his voice further stripped away into a malicious rattle-pyre hatred as his tale went on. Oh, her blood did he drink, drink and drink, until she no longer answered her master's siren call. For many a night he had searched for her, starving of the young mistress's blood when he discovered the truth of her absence. For after they last met... The natives spoke against her to the ever-righteous Father Durkinshaw, who, in all his holy practices, ruled her to the world, and Holy Father above as a witch, a devil's familiar, which their faith unwavering in their blind convictions, the distraught Lord discovered that his maiden had been felled, like many a maiden caught victim to blind conviction, by a raging fire like this, before you all now. Screams of inhuman agony deafened the congregation as the wild, untamed flames began to shape and form themselves into the form of a delicate young maiden. Just as soon as its fiery birth was complete, a blackened maw opened that released an agonized wail that invoked an unutterable pain and sorrow that blended with the presently potent fear within the mass that could not and would not waver. As the flames returned to their former state, unyielding in their enraged ferocity, the stranger began again. His ghastly vocals took on an air of aggression. Vengeance, his inhuman voice barked. Vengeance, he swore to exact on those whose holy ways led them to commit this atrocity. Upon them in the cold night, he came. Many a morn following... The families would find more of their dear beloved gone in the night, only to be spied upon the succeeding dusk as one of the disciples of the Nosferatu, Lord Vladimir Clavicolus. I condemn you all, you bleeding sheep of the Lord. He roared to them one full moon twilight. Damn you, damn you all, whose faith blinds you to the wills existent beyond God's law. Your actions deemed righteous by your God, because of your lack of vision and lack of control, stripped me of what I held dear to me. For this I declare that, as long as I am bound to walk these lands with earthly feet, the setting sun on this night for every generation to come, myself and my dwellers of the night will come. Any of whom we spy in their play, we shall strip away from you, as you stripped her away from me. For this I swear to you, and all whose faith and corrupted practice conduct your lives, for this night will belong to us, the Nosferatu, the Vampire. I christen this very gravely dusk, along with every such that recurs on every century to come. 
as the Nosferatu Nacht, the Vampire's Night. And upon his declaration's conclusion, the Vampire, Lord Clavicalus, began his dark campaign with sating his feral ire with the blood he spilled from the great priest, Father Durkinshaw. Many perished at the wrath and burning ire for the warm, innocent blood that night before the sun rose, warding him away until the next annual cycle awakened him, concluding in the same grotesque manner as before. The abysmal cacophony intensified to a deafening pitch, with only the stranger's ghoulishly rasping voice being able to be distinguished separately. From that night, and every Nosferatu knocked since, Lord Clavicalus has walked on this cold night, sating his desire for blood on those who foolishly neglect to pay credence to his words. Upon the conclusion of the stranger's horrifying anecdote, the mad cackles of malice abruptly died, shrouding the congregation in a jarring silence, save only for the crackling of the flames. As the stranger began to remove his trench coat and hat for the first time, revealing a gaunt and bony face bound with gray, clammy flesh pulled taut over his skull and long wispy strands of albino hair, his cold blue dead lips began to part upwards into a deranged vulpine grin that exposed unnaturally long, thin canine molars as sharp as the nobleman's dagger. Upon sight of this, a young maiden from the terror-stricken audience squealed out, Who are you? The stranger, stealing his gaze away from the festive pyre for the first time, fixed his eyes to her. My dear delicate blossom, I am Lord Vladimir Clavicalus of the Eastern Kingdoms, and tonight is Nosferatu Nacht, the Vampire's Night. At the chilling revelation, the blazing fire burst skyward, defiantly into the air to illuminate the hordes of beasts that took residence in lurking darkness only moments before, every one of them bearing their vicious fangs, for indeed these were the disciples of the vampire Clavicalus. No sooner than the first squeal of hysteria was let out that the stranger, the vampire, Lord Clavicalus bared his fangs rolling his eyes back into his skull with pleasure as he clamped his jaw around the young maiden's neck, savoring every last amount of crimson he could take from her. As he rose from her, now stripped of life, the once furious flames abruptly ceased, shrouding the helpless mass in complete darkness. As the Nosferatu came upon them, try as they might, none of the commoners could escape the inhuman, and supernatural clutches of the scourging beasts as they were swept away and torn apart like a herd of lamb amid the wolf's den from what must have been every direction in the impossible looming darkness. No cries for mercy were heard or heeded when the sun rose that morn. Silence had laid its claim to Berkingshire. All that remained of the events of the accursed night were the smoldering embers of the festive pyre and the mutilated and exsanguinated remains of the Lore Knight Mass, now set to become eternally bound to the tradition of the Nosferatu Nacht. There was a period of my life where I chose to be homeless. It may seem strange to you, but the town I lived in had extremely unaffordable renting prices, and I preferred to lay out under the stars and fall asleep to the sound of the water running in the nearby creek and waking up to the chirping of birds. I had a decent job, strictly for saving up money that would enable me to travel so my paychecks were never cashed but rather stayed at my good buddy's house, just piling and piling up into a thick stack of paper for future deposit. I figured I would cash them all shortly prior to taxes being due. Not having a bank, because I don't like or trust them, I usually dealt with straight cash, and if I had to use a card, I would transfer it into my PayPal account. 
that's about as close to a bank as I wanted to get. Food was never an issue. Either my boss would provide meals at my work site, or I would visit a few of the many food banks in the city. If I really needed, I could go on food stamps, but that is a government program that is better suited for individuals who truly need it, and I did not want to take advantage since I could viably attain my own food. My free time was spent reading at the library while I charged my cell phone, or I would use the computers if I needed to use a keyboard for an extended amount of time. There were showers every other day right next door, at no expense, so I took advantage of that. Many times I would take a shower at my buddy's house, where I spent many evenings playing dice games or cribbage, watching movies, etc. My homelessness was optional, and I wanted for nothing. It was not without hardships or inconveniences, though. There were nights spent just wandering around, stumbling onto somebody else's sight, and being run off. There were mornings where I woke up to find out that I had been robbed while I slept. Once I jerked awake by some druggie who thought he was picking up his own sleeping bag and didn't notice me inside it. He yelled at me a bit and then took a piss next to my head and stumbled off. After a while, I found a camping spot that was ideal for camping. It was on the outskirts of town, off into the rolling green hills that were covered with dense patches of trees and labyrinth creeks. My camping spot was on the top of a terrace with running water nearby, encircled by thick trees and completely flat and soft. It was difficult to find, which meant feeling anxious of others encroaching on my area was unnecessary. Among the hills where this location is, however, is imbued with rumors and legends. The story goes that on the cusp of the 19th and 20th century, it was a mine of sorts. Whether it was silver or gold, or something else I have never been able to unravel through any research. Onward, the legend persists that the mine collapsed and was abandoned and basically forgotten. Townspeople and generations that came before them never could quite pinpoint the location of this supposed mine. There were many such landmarks supposedly in the hills that nobody could quite locate, but insisted were up there. According to some, there was a cannon, just abandoned and forsaken, up on one of the numerous unnamed hills. And on another hill, rumor has it there was a desolate bell tower, with the bell still intact. Many have claimed to see parts of an airplane that crashed decades ago, and simply were never removed due to the logistics of moving heavy parts in an inaccessible terrain. Many years after the mine supposedly collapsed and onward into the 1920s, some of the tunnels into the mine were cleared out and used as some sort of federally funded bunker that served as a laboratory, carrying on the legacy of secrecy and myth. This myth was most likely created due to the amount of biology and agricultural students that attended the town university. Locals as old as the hills of the town would tell stories about animals being genetically engineered. One old-timer told me and my friends that there were scientists of some sort, hidden in the hills, experimenting and creating cougars that walked on all four legs, but had the feathery face of a raptor, a bird of prey, hawk-like and demonish. Some other locals spoke of giant rats with the head of a wolfhound. This, of course, is all bogus, and I don't believe any of it. It's ridiculous to think of such things. These are fairy tales, boogeyman accounts, fireside horror. I never gave any of these stories any credence, and I still am not quite sure that I do to this day. But, there is a spookiness on top of those rolling hills, some nights sleeping up there. It got strange. Once, I had been woken up by the sound of a vehicle. It sparked my curiosity because there weren't even any functioning fire roads anymore. Unmistakably, it was the sound of a truck. When I roused myself out of my sleeping bag and followed the noises and peered out through the dense trees, 
and downward towards the town. Sure enough, there was a pickup truck driving below me towards some spot in the hills that I was unfamiliar with. To me, it seemed as if it were a government truck. It was all white with the city emblem on the door. The lights were bright. The speed was consistent. The pathway it drove on seemed rugged and difficult, but the vehicle was deliberate. It knew exactly where it was going. The evening after that, before sundown, I chose to explore the path that I had seen the truck driving, following the crushed down grass and weeds. But after a while it just got too rocky and difficult to determine where the tracks were, and though I had combed the area as well as I could, I never found anything other than more hills, tiny creeks, and patches of trees. A month or so after that, in the middle of the night, I was roused by something walking in the brush that enveloped me. Whatever it was, it was massive. We don't have any big animals in my area. Raccoons, possums, things like that are about all anybody would ever see. We did have a cougar every now and then, and packs of coyotes. I have lived in various wildernesses all my life. I know the sound of every footfall of just about every mammal in North America. Almost. The sound of the steps were heavy, big and rough, slow, purposeful. It was no cougar. Most of the time you aren't lucky enough to hear them until it's too late. It wasn't a coyote either unless it was the size of a Volkswagen bug. The steps went in circles around me, round and around. It's as if it didn't want to get too close, or perhaps was considering closing in, just biding time or something. I lifted my head out to get a better look, but the darkness would not allow it. That's when the growling began. Low, deep, threatening growls. Not the growls of a raccoon. Not the growls of a person or a dog. It was way too low of pitch for that, and the volume was unthinkable. The duration was impressive. The sound was seemingly long, almost a minute without stopping between. I could not move. I lay there too scared to even shake, to breathe to scream. I became a statue laying in a sleeping bag. My mind raced, going over every animal I could think of, could possibly imagine, all while whispering to myself, What is that? After I don't know how long the footsteps faded away, returning back to wherever they came from, back off down into the hills below. I turned on my flashlight and scrambled out of my sleeping bag and walked toward the tree line without bothering to put on my boots. All around I searched and found no tracks or marks or any indication anything had ever been there. I went into the thick patch of trees and shined the light down into the hill and saw no movement, no life. All was still. I was barking up the wrong tree. Returning to my campsite, I sat down on one of the logs I used as my sitting spot and shivered nervously until the day broke. Foolishly, I remained at that spot for a few more months until three things happened in a short amount of time that made me decide I had had enough. One night, randomly, I woke up to the sound of walking and lifted my head from my sleeping bag and saw a woman just walking past my sight. She did not acknowledge me. She did not say a word. Clad in normal wear, she walked onward, out of my sight and away from me. She had no hiking boots or backpack. She appeared to be just a normal person. However, it was three in the morning, and there would be no reason for some lady to be walking out in this part of the hills this early in the morning. I had a cell phone that had an alarm on it, and it would wake me up every weekday at 5.30 a.m. It was very distinct, 
and it had been the same tone for two of three years. One of the nights I woke up with an unyielding necessity to relinquish my bodily fluids. Scrambling out of my sleeping bag and placing my boots on my feet, I looked up at the clear sky, enjoying the chirrups of the crickets as I walked 50 feet into the bushes to take a number one. As I stood there doing my business, I heard my cell phone alarm going off. 5.30? I asked myself. Suddenly it hit me. It was not my alarm. It was whistling. Somebody or something nearby was whistling the exact same melody as my phone alarm. Same duration, volume, pitch, all of it. A perfect replica. Upon this realization, I whirled around without even zipping up. Hello? I shouted out into the void. Who's there? The whistling stopped and all was silent. All was still. A moment or two went by, and the crickets picked back up again. I rushed to my sleeping bag and hid myself inside of it as much as I possibly could. I was in a cocoon of fear, sobbing to myself in the darkness, mumbling. That was weird. That was so weird. Mentioning this to anybody else did not seem like the best concept to me at the time. Very few people knew how I lived, and I didn't want to invite any sort of harassment into it. I didn't wager that people would understand my decision to be homeless. Also, the collection of stories just seemed crazy and unbelievable. Of course, there are many homeless people who are not on drugs and are not crazy, but there are definitely those that are, and I felt if I were to tell my accounts to anybody, I would certainly be taken for a madman, or on drugs, or both. When I got out of work that day, I had enough light to go exploring. I went off into the same hills I always had, but this time I took a different route. It had an obscure entrance, and unless you really knew the area, it was invisible to the untrained eye. The pathway was steep, arduous, daunting. Every now and again I would place my eyes on the hill where I knew my campsite lay, allowing me to get more and more lost in the unexplored jungle that so many locals never bothered to set foot in. An hour followed by me randomly walking until I came up a hill with a sudden drop. To the sides there was a decline, a small grade. Taking one of the grades on the side let me down to a flat bottom and I realized why it looked like the hill suddenly dropped off. It was a tunnel, a tunnel that was packed to the brim with colossal stones. On either side of the tunnel were large wooden beams with a gigantic one resting on top of the other two. The mine, I whispered to myself. I was in disbelief. I had actually found it. I don't remember what path I took to stumble onto it, and I wasn't sure if I would be able to stumble onto it ever again. But there it was. It was the abandoned mine long lost to many memories. I chuckled proudly to myself, mostly out of discomfort, then noticed that it would be getting dim soon, and thus decided to return to my camp. Two steps were taken, and then I noticed it. A large metal box. I'd wager it was ten feet long by eight feet wide, made out of steel and beginning to rust red, with holes lined up around it. It looked like a storage container, but smaller, like a cage. A cage where the door was unlatched and wide open. It made me feel overwhelmed with dread. It seemed like something was in that cage. Something alive. Whatever that something was, it was out now. I rushed back to my camp, and as I did, I did my best to ignore the eerie feeling of the sight as I sat down on my log by my sleeping bag. 
something inside me told me things were not quite right. That night, I had trouble falling asleep. I lay there trying to decide if I needed to find another spot or cash one of my paychecks and get a hotel or crash on one of my friend's couches. I just wasn't sure. I wasn't even sure if I knew if I was insane or not. I questioned myself many times. Thoughts invaded my brain, wondering if that government truck had a purpose for being up on the unnamed hills. Perhaps the truck arrived there to unleash a demon from a cage. Perhaps there was a lady up in the hills that served as a caged creature keeper. That's when I heard my own voice coming out of the bushes, crying out, That was weird. That was so weird. I jumped out of my sleeping bag like a bullet leaves a barrel. I snatched my backpack and I ran like an Olympian down the hill as quickly as my legs had ever carried me. I left my sleeping bag and my blanket up on the top and never retrieved them. The next day I cashed my paychecks and made a deposit for a room to rent in a nice house downtown in the middle of civilization, away from the creeks and the hills and the trees. I often reflect on this duration of my life. I constantly question what happened. Some will say that there is no predator in nature that is more dangerous than mankind. I am not so sure about that. I am of the mind that the most terrifying thing to cross paths with are the things that make no sense, the things that are unbelievable, the things that are unknown. The painting had been put up for auction at a local event raising money for charity. It was an original, according to the auctioneer, by an obscure but talented artist from the early 1900s. It was almost the end of the day and I had yet to see anything that caught my fancy. But the moment the painting was unveiled, I felt something stir in my chest, and I knew I had to have it. Nobody else seemed quite as enthused as me about the portrait, and winning it had been a relatively simple affair. After countering a few other vaguely interested buyers, I managed to secure it for myself. I had it wrapped up in a piece of old moth-eaten cloth that was found in the auction warehouse, and I stowed it in the back of my car, excited to find a place for it in my home. I was a collector of sorts, mostly of antiques and other knickknacks, so it would fit right in with the assortment of old ceramic pots and tarnished clocks and statues that I had sitting in my display cabinet. On the way home from the auction, I started to feel restless. I wasn't sure if it was because the auction had lasted longer than I expected, or because I was tired, or something else, but I struggled to focus on driving and almost pulled out right in front of another car as I turned at the junction leading left towards my house. When I finally pulled into the driveway of my semi-detached, I cut the engine and sat for a moment behind the wheel, taking a couple of deep breaths to clear my mind. When I flicked a glance up towards the rear view, I thought for just a moment that I had glimpsed a shadow pressed against the back seat of the car. Between one blink and the next, however, the shadow had disappeared, and I rubbed my eyes, realizing I must have been more tired than I thought. I twisted around to double-check the back seat, just in case, but there really was nothing there. I stepped out of the car. I headed round to the trunk of the car and popped it open. The painting was where I had left it, nestled safely in its bandage of thick yellow cloth. Gripping the edges of the frame, I hoisted it out of the car, careful not to knock the corners against the trunk. Balancing it on one knee, I used my free hand to slam the trunk closed and locked the car behind me, heading up the drive towards the front door. 
Somewhere behind me, I felt the strange sensation of being watched. Assuming it was one of my neighbors, I turned around to wave, but there was nobody there. The street was empty, deserted. I was the only one out here. Shrugging it off, I headed inside. Laying the covered painting down on the mahogany dining table, I carefully stripped the cloth away to unearth the portrait. It was even more beautiful seeing it up close, instead of across the auction hall. I wasn't a painting connoisseur by any means, but even I could appreciate the balance of colors and the masterful brushstrokes used to create the dichotomy between the subject's face and the backdrop. The signature in the corner, scrawled in black ink, read, Thomas Mallory. That was the name of the painter. I had never heard of him before the auction, but the painting itself was a masterful piece of portraiture that held up against even more well-known names. I wasn't entirely sure who the depicted subject was, but judging by the brush and palette he was holding and the easel in front of him, the subject must have been a painter too. Perhaps it was even a self-portrait of Thomas Mallory himself. The frame was a deep brass with golden highlights, but there was a faint layer of dust and grime on the edges of the frame, suggesting it had been stored somewhere damp prior to the auction. So I got some low chemical cleaning supplies and tried my best to clean it up. By the time I was done, the frame was glistening in the swaths of the fading sun pouring in through the window. It wouldn't be long until dusk fell. I must have been sitting here for hours polishing the frame, and my wrist had grown sore. Satisfied with my work, I took the painting over to the display cabinet in my sitting room. Despite the wide array of antiques, I did dust regularly, and the air was tinged with the scent of lemon and rose disinfectant. I hadn't quite decided where I would hang the painting yet, so instead I propped it up on the mantelpiece beside the cabinet, above the bricked-up fire that hadn't been used in years. Sometimes, when I hadn't dusted in a while, I could still smell the tinge of ash and smoke embedded within the bricks. Making sure the painting was secure between the wall and the mantel shelf, I stepped back and admired the portrait in the light of the fading sun. There was something almost melancholy about the painter's face, those eyes that sparkled with an unusual, almost corporeal luster, seemed to be filled with a longing of sorts, a yearning for something that was just out of reach. But maybe I was just seeing things that weren't really there, like the shadow in the car. The light outside was fading rapidly, but part of me couldn't draw my eyes away from the painting or the man's woeful expression. Why had the painter portrayed him this way? What was the story behind each stroke of the brush? I don't think I, or anyone, would ever truly understand what was going through the painter's mind as he created this piece of art. That, after all, was the beauty and pain of subjectivity, of art, of interpretation. Nobody shared the same idea of inference and understanding, especially when it came to something like this. But perhaps I was overthinking it. I shook myself out of my daze, realizing that the sun had already set. Dusk painting the edges of the sky in shades of dark purple. I should get something to eat before I go to bed, I thought vaguely as I left the room, closing the door behind me. That night, I awoke to darkness and the feeling that I wasn't alone. I lived on my own, as I had done since separating from my partner a few years ago, and didn't have any pets. There was no probable reason why I would feel like there was someone else here with me, but it was something I felt with a strange sort of certainty, that there was someone here in the dark, lurking just out of sight. My heart began to flutter in my chest, panic rising up through my stomach, but I swallowed it down. I was being silly. 
Of course there was nobody else here. I had locked all the doors and windows before I went to bed. I was sure of it. But I still couldn't quite shake that feeling of unease that tiptoed along the back of my neck, making sweat bead along my skin. Breathing softly through my nose, I fumbled through the dark until my fingers closed around the light switch, clicking it on. Bright yellow light flooded the room, and I threw up a hand to shield my eyes from the glare. Squinting between my fingers, I looked around the room. Empty, as I expected. There really was nobody here. But then I noticed something that made my throat clench up once more. The bedroom door was open. I always slept with it closed, the way I had done since I was a child. I very rarely went to bed with it open, even by accident. Had someone really been in my room? Or was this one of those very rare occurrences where I had forgotten to close it? No. I was certain I had shut it. I remembered the creak and the click of the old door against the frame. It had become an almost bedtime ritual, and I would have felt something was off earlier in the night if I had left it open. I gazed at the crack in the door frame, shadows pooling around the edges, fear tightening in my chest. Was there someone in the house? Should I call the police? No, not without investigating first. I didn't want to waste their time if it really was just my imagination. Conjuring threats from nothing. Slipping out of bed, I tiptoed over to the open door, my fingers trembling as they gripped the handle, pulling it open wider. Light from the bedroom spilt out into the landing, illuminating the rest of the corridor. I couldn't see anything immediately out of place. I held my breath for a few seconds and listened. Above the pounding of my own heart, I could hear nothing, just the faint moan of the wind and the rustle of the leaves. The house was deathly silent. Swallowing back the lump in my throat, I stepped out of the room and tiptoed down the stairs. I wanted to make sure there really was nobody else in the house before I went back to bed. Downstairs was silent too, except for the faint, intermittent drip of the kitchen tap. I had gotten a glass of water before bed, so perhaps I hadn't twisted the faucet all the way. I padded into the kitchen, switching on the lights as I went, and tightened the leaky tap until it stopped dripping. Feeling somewhat less terrified, I went through each room, checking behind doorways and in closets to make sure nobody was hiding. Every room proved empty. The last place to check was the living room, where the painting was. In a brief lapse of judgment, I considered the possibility that a thief had broken into the house to steal the painting. But who would steal a painting by a less known artist after I had only owned it for a day? Shaking away the thought, I approached the living room door and froze. It was one of those old-fashioned doors with a frosted glass window. On the other side of the window stood a shadow. A shadow that wasn't supposed to be there. Fear stabbed my chest, my heart racing. Was there someone on the other side? The shadow wasn't moving. Maybe it was nothing after all but I had never noticed it before, and I was sure there was nothing on the other side of the door that could be casting it. Heart thundering in my chest, I went back to the kitchen to grab a knife from the drawer and hurried back. The shadow was still there. With a short, sharp breath, I shoved the door open and swung the knife around the edge of the door. Nothing. There was nothing there. A bead of sweat cooled on my brow. All that panic for nothing. Maybe I really was just overthinking it all. I checked the painting just to be sure, but it hadn't moved an inch. In the dark, the eyes seemed to glisten like obsidian, 
eerily realistic. I took a moment to calm my racing heart and rationalize the situation, then left the room, closing the door behind me. This time when I glanced back, the shadow was gone. The next morning I decided to do some research and see what I could dig up about Thomas Mallory and his work. I thought it odd that last night's experience had come right after bringing the painting into my home. Perhaps I was being paranoid and making connections where there weren't any, but I was still curious to see what I could find out. Surely someone somewhere must know something about him, even if he was a more obscure name in the art world. I searched for the name on the internet, but all I could immediately find were articles about Thomas Mallory, the writer, not the painter of the portrait sitting in my living room. After scrolling through countless websites and forums, I finally managed to find a page dedicated to the right Mallory. There was an old black and white depiction of him, and I recognized him immediately as the same figure in the painting. It was a self-portrait after all. I was sitting with my laptop on the couch in the living room, and my gaze lifted to the painting. Mallory gazed somberly down at me, making my chest pinch. Returning my attention to the webpage, I read through a brief history of his life. According to the text, Thomas Mallory had never managed to succeed as a painter during life and had died in poverty without selling more than one or two of his works. Towards the end of his life, Mallory had begun to rant about how he had been able to find his muse and that he would keep searching for her even after death. He blamed the muses for forsaking him as the reason he had been so unsuccessful and had apparently passed away in a state of bitter despair. When I scrolled down to the bottom, a soft gasp parted my lips. There was a section titled, Mallory's Last Work, and the picture attached was the very same one that now sat on my mantle. Mallory's self-portrait. The last ever painting he created before his death. Was that the reason for his despondent look? Had he been unhappy with his career? At a loss? Abandoned by the muses? Was that the message the portrait portrayed? I studied it from across the room, raking my eyes over the paintbrush poised against the painted canvas, the palette of muted colors almost drooping in his hand. Was this when he was on the verge of abandoning his passion altogether? Or was that searching, longing look in his eye a plea to the muses, to hear his desperate call? I shook my head, closing my laptop with a sigh. Thomas Mallory, despite being a wonderful artist, had suffered the same fate as so many artists had. Unappreciated, unrewarded, dying nameless and poor. It was only after death that they truly found fame. The following night, I woke up once more to the feeling that I was being watched from the dark. The room was pitch dark. Through the netted curtains, there was not even a glimpse of the moon. Only the dark, starless sky, like the open maw of a beast. I sat up, rubbing my eyes. It was just after three o'clock in the morning, according to my watch. Using one hand to switch on the lamp, I squeezed my eyes closed against the light, waiting a few seconds for my eyes to stop watering and finally adjust. The air in the room was still, undisturbed. The door was closed. Nothing felt out of place, except for the strange prickle of unease tiptoeing down my spine. I gazed around the room for a few minutes, waiting in silence for something to happen. But nothing did. Once again, it was all in my head. I reached for the lamp again, my fingers brushing the switch. The moment the room plunged into darkness was the moment I heard it. Footsteps. Soft, 
muted footsteps coming from somewhere deeper in the house. I held my breath, my pulse racing beneath my ribcage. Was I hearing things? There, against the quiet of the night, was the sound of retreating footfalls. Someone was inside the house. This time there was no mistake. Fighting the rising panic in my chest, I fumbled to switch on the light and slipped out of bed. The air was cold against my legs, and I shivered, tiptoeing towards the door. I wrapped my fingers around the handle and tugged it open, as quietly as I could. I peered out. Nothing. The footsteps grew fainter, moving further away, until eventually I could hear them no more. Had they already left? I didn't want to leave anything to chance. Keeping close to the wall, I padded down the hallway and stood at the foot of the stairs, peering down. I couldn't see anything. Nothing stirred amongst the shadows. Silence pressed against me like something tangible, broken only by my short, panicked pants. Taking the stairs slowly, I reached the bottom and peered around the edge of the banister. My vision swam in the darkness, and I tried to ignore the feeling that there was something crouched in the shadows, waiting to catch me off guard. It's all in your head. This time I passed by the kitchen and the dining room, and went straight to the living room. Straight to the painting. The door was open. Inside the darkness felt thick, suffocating. I reached blindly through the dark until I found the light switch, flipping it on. The room felt warmer than the rest of the house. The air felt disturbed like someone had been here recently. There was nobody hiding behind the doorway. Nobody crouched behind the sofa. Everything was in its place. Closing the door behind me, I walked up to the painting and gasped. My legs wobbled, feeling like they were about to give way. My head began to spin, not quite willing to believe what I was seeing. The painting had changed. The painter, Thomas Mallory, had disappeared, leaving an empty space, a dark, mottled void where he once stood. The paintbrush and palette had been discarded, and the canvas, that had before been turned the other way, was now facing me, containing a new painting, a new portrait, a portrait that looked exactly like me. When I was a child, I used to have a dream where I would be mauled by a black panther. There are no panthers here. I live in a small town in southern Ontario with nothing to do, filled with do-nothings and semi-rural town mice. But in my young mind, all the facts I could pick up about the world outside of our community, any facts about exotic worlds abroad, large and more interesting animals, and things generally not seen around these parts could easily meld together in my dreams. It was a dream I had relatively often, and I had nightmares regularly. This is one of those vivid dreams that just stuck with me in the back of my head, even into adulthood, as I sit here and recall it to you now. I grew up with an avid love of the outdoors and subsequently spent the majority of my life, seasons permitting, hiking, camping, and swimming in the tame and domestic landscape of my home county along the north shore of Lake Erie. Eventually, I got older, left home, and often I would try to plan vacations all around the province. I camped under the stars in Bruce County and listened to the haunting calls of loons as they sang to each other in the cool, late summer night. I slept in a one-room cabin and fished for my meals on the still and pristine waters of Marshall Lake, near Lake Nipissing. 
I planned my first portage at age 21 in Algonquin Park, where I saw moose, black bears, and beavers. The outdoors are what I grew to consider my own individual sacred space. I could go there and be human without all the modern humanity, and still to this day, it is something my life basically revolves around. I have never questioned this, save for one time. Now, I have always seen myself as a rational person. I'm not a snob about religion or people who believe in whatever they do, but I tend to lean towards the side of science and logical thinking more than anything. There are many forces at work, and nearly all of them have rational, scientific explanations. Those that don't simply don't yet have solid explanations yet. But I have no idea what happened to me during the course of the story that I'm about to share, and I have never experienced anything like it since then. All things considered, I really hope I never do. It was a night I'll never forget. A night when I ventured deep into the heart of the northern Ontario wilderness and came face to face with the unimaginable. I won't tell you exactly where it was, simply to ensure that nobody with inclinations to do so might go looking for a similar experience. The forests here are unlike any I had ever encountered before, dense and ancient, with towering pine and spruce trees that seemed to scrape the very heavens. The ground was blanketed in a lush carpet of moss and ferns, and the air was thick with the scent of pine needles and damp earth. I had set up camp by the shores of a serene, mirror-like lake, its surface reflecting the canopy of stars overhead. The moon cast an ethereal glow on the landscape, but the silence was unsettling, as if the woods held their breath, concealing secrets as old as time itself. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long, shoft shadows that danced among the trees, I built a small fire to ward off the encroaching darkness. My curiosity had brought me to this remote corner of northern Ontario, having long sought to visit more isolated locations further north from Algonquin. The thought of following in the footsteps of my own forebears, who came to this country as trappers, was something I always wanted to pursue. I imagined them traveling through parts similar to these, as they portaged through the thick brush on the way to the nearby river, just out of sight in the now darkening treescape. I take pride in my heritage and the country I live in, and I have always been more than keen to get out there and see everything this beautiful wilderness has to offer. I have seen a lot, and I am well-traveled, a seasoned woodsman at this point in my life. There's not much that can shock me out here, but any naturalist will tell you that nature always finds a way to humble those who think they have seen it all. And what happened to me next was something that I never would have anticipated in my life, and it shook me to my core. As I sat by the fire, my heart sank beneath a growing unease, a feeling that I was not alone, that unseen eyes were fixed upon me. I dismissed it as mere paranoia, convincing myself that it was the wild imagination of an urban dweller in the wilderness. Yet the unease persisted, gnawing at the edges of my consciousness. Then it happened. A blood-curdling howl that pierced the silence of the night. It echoed through the forest, a haunting lament that seemed to reverberate through the very trees themselves. I froze, my breath catching in my throat, and I knew that this was no ordinary sound. The howl came again, closer this time, carrying with it a malevolence that seemed to seep into my very bones. Panic surged within me, and I fumbled to grab my flashlight, the feeble beam casting trembling shadows on the ancient trees. And then I saw it, a creature emerged from the shadows, a nightmare in the form of sleek night. Its fur was as dark as the depths of the abyss, and its eyes, two crimson orbs, 
burned with an otherworldly fire. It moved with a predatory grace, its sleek form almost melting into the enveloping darkness. My flashlight's beam danced over the creature, revealing gleaming, razor-sharp claws that seemed to shimmer in the night. In that moment, the very fabric of reality seemed to fray, and I could feel an invasive presence in my mind, like tendrils of darkness wrapping around my thoughts. My voice caught in my throat as I tried to scream, but sheer terror propelled me to my feet, and I fled from the campsite, leaving behind my possessions and any semblance of reason. Behind me I could hear haunting laughter, a sound that reverberated through the ancient trees and seemed to mock my feeble escape. I fled from the campsite, my heart pounding in my chest, as I made my way through the tangled undergrowth of the northern Ontario wilderness. The creature, the nightmare with gleaming crimson eyes, pursued me relentlessly, its sinister laughter echoing through the trees. In my frantic rush to escape, I tripped over a gnarled tree root hidden beneath the mossy forest floor. I tumbled forward, hitting the ground hard. The wind knocked out of me. Gasping for breath, I tried to push myself up, but a searing pain shot through my ankle, bringing me back down flat on my face again. As I looked up from the ground, I could not believe my eyes. The creature the hulking, cat-like terror, seemed to dematerialize right before me. It was as if it had dissolved into the very shadows it came from. Relief washed over me. I let my guard down, thinking I had escaped. I looked around and saw nothing. As I started to calm down, any sense of ease started to wane, as I realized the woods around me were still as if time had stopped. Not a whisper of the wind or a rustling branch made a sound, and the chatter of frogs and crickets fell mute, as if they had all simply vanished. I quickly got back up on my feet, and keeping low and as quiet as possible, started to make my way back out towards the valley that held the nearby dirt road that I took to get into these woods. The way out was still a long ways away, but at least on the trail, I could put some serious distance between me and the deeper forest and get back into civilization. But then, out of nowhere, the creature seemed to just sort of spawn in, its shape coming into material form from the darkness. It was there, looming over me with those malevolent crimson eyes, as if mocking my brief respite. Panic surged through me once more, and I scrambled to get out of there. The chase continued, the creature stalking me with an unearthly determination. I pushed through the wilderness, down into the valley and back onto the path, my breath coming in sharp, ragged gasps like daggers in my lungs, my heart a relentless drumbeat in my chest. No longer a concern as I sped through the wilderness. The trees seemed to close in around me, the night air growing colder and thicker, with each passing moment. I couldn't shake the feeling that this creature, this thing, was toying with me, relishing in the fear it had instilled. The forest itself seemed to conspire against me, as if it were a part of the creature's design. With every ounce of strength and determination, I pressed on, driven by the primal instinct to survive and the chilling realization that there was no escape from the unknown terror that lurked in the heart of the wilderness. The pathway seemed to stretch, to double, maybe even triple its length. It seemed to wind and veer off in ways that I didn't remember it doing before. At this point I was so stricken with fear I couldn't even begin to question it. I just kept moving. There was no way this trail was the wrong one. This was the only access into these woods at the valley. It must have been me. If I didn't die in there, I would surely go mad if I did not escape. After what seemed like hours longer than I knew the journey down the trail to take, I finally came to the familiar landmarks telling me the end to the trail 
and to where I had parked my truck. I emerged from the wilderness, shaken and disoriented, but with an overwhelming sense of relief that I had narrowly escaped a fate worse than death. I can't shake the feeling that that thing still watches and waits, just beyond the edge of the darkness, in the heart of northern Ontario's ancient and untamed wilderness. Years later, I am still wrapping my head around what happened to me. I haven't really found anything outside the realm of urban legends or cougar encounters. Let me say right now that this creature in my mind could not have been a cougar. This thing was massive. I am aware that in parts it sounds like a cougar account, but this thing howled. I'm not sure what it is that chased me that night but I am dead certain of two things. One, if that thing got a hold of me, I would have been ripped apart, and no more if I were anything less than the luckiest person on the planet. Two, I have way more of those nightmares of being mauled by a panther these days. This story isn't really scary so much as it is weird. There are no monsters, no creepers, no ghosts or demons. Just completely unexplainable happenings that I swear are true. Although I'm really not sure how. My wife and I recently had a child and decided to move somewhere with a little more opportunity for our family. There are four of us now. Myself, my wife, her son, my stepson and our newborn son. My stepson just recently turned 11 and was a little apprehensive at first, but quickly settled into his new surroundings. I had come up two months prior to find adequate housing for the four of us and get a job that would support the move. I stayed on one of my old friend's couches and he was kind enough to let me stay as long as I needed to get established here. The real estate market being what it is in Ontario it was extremely challenging and nerve-wracking, but at the last minute, right when I needed things to happen, I found a place. Once our newborn son was born and my wife was ready to travel, we quickly moved my family into the small upper-level apartment I found for us in a small neighborhood of the city that we now call home. It's small, but it's clean, and it's enough for us to get started in a new town. The apartment has access to the front door and a private entrance in the back that leads out to a long deck along the back of the duplex. The neighborhood we live in is a quiet residential area wedged between a major roadway and a set of industrial railroad tracks that mark the start of an industrial area. A short walk down the road, past a concrete yard and an impound lot, is another main road with a Walmart and a grocery store just around the corner. I really lucked out with the job, too. The timing was great, and the money I make now comfortably covers everything we need. I have to ride share to get there, but that's not really a problem in the area we live. It's a 25-minute walk in one direction, down Queenston Street, to the downtown bus station, where my ride share picks me up. I don't mind the walking, either. I'm the kind of person who will just daydream and tune out. I really love just walking and thinking, and I make it a sort of ritual every morning to make that walk, grab a drink, and really wake up before I get to work. I went to college here, so I'm pretty familiar with the area, and it's really easy to just tune out and end up where I'm going without much thought. We don't drive, so once a week, one of us will walk up to the grocery store plaza and do all of our shopping. One day, about a month after we moved in, my wife and stepson went out to run some quick errands in the early afternoon while I stayed home with the baby and did some cleaning. The trip there and back usually takes about an hour with shopping, and I like to play this game where I try to do as much tidying as possible before they come home if I stay behind. About 20 minutes later, I was in the middle of doing some dishes when the front door opened. 
and the unmistakable shuffle of my family came up the stairs. Surprised that they were back so early, I assumed they must have turned around. Maybe she forgot her wallet or something. But when she got to the top of the stairs, she met me with an even more confused look on her face. I was about to ask why they turned around, and if they had forgotten something, and my stepson came up the stairs with a few arms full of grocery bags. Sorry it took us so long. We were on our way back, and we just weren't sure what happened. What do you mean? You've only been gone 20 minutes at most. I pointed out, and looked at my phone to confirm. This is when it got a little weird, and I noticed that they both seemed a little bewildered. So I asked what was the matter, and this is what they told me. They both swear up and down that when they were walking home from the grocery store, they got to the railway line that borders the start of the neighborhood, and according to them, the whole road just started over again. They both clearly remember walking down the majority of our road through the long section of the industrial area. And then in the blink of an eye, they were back at the busy road they turned off. Under any other circumstance, I might think maybe it was just them not really paying attention, but they both tuned out and didn't realize that they hadn't yet gotten to the tracks. But I did find it a little odd that they were back in 20 minutes with groceries when the trip takes about an hour, and by their accounts, it took them longer than that. At any rate, we just filed it under strange and got on with life pretty quickly. It was just weird. A couple of weeks later, I was walking to the convenience store around the corner one night on my day off, and when I was walking back from the store, it only took me two minutes. This is hard to describe, but not only do I have zero memory of the space in between the convenience store and the turnoff onto my road, but I remember vividly getting to the store completely. I did a double take when I got onto my road, and it was as if the buildings between the intersection and the store were just sort of deleted. They simply were not there. Oh, I must be going insane, I thought to myself. I turned around once again, not even a blink, and the street corner was back to normal. What is going on? A little shaken and extremely confused. I quickly got back down the street and back to my place. When I got home, I was met with the same confused look that I had a few weeks prior, and my wife peeked her head out the door and down the stairs. Did you forget something? What is happening here? On a fateful December morning in 1948, Somerton Beach, with its tranquil sands and gentle waves, it became the setting for a mystery that would defy explanation for generations to come. The sun was just beginning to break over the horizon when a passerby stumbled upon a man's lifeless body. He was impeccably dressed in a well-tailored suit and tie, giving the appearance of a man of refinement. However, upon closer inspection, it became evident that this was no ordinary discovery. It marked the beginning of an extraordinary enigma. The man's attire bore a peculiar characteristic. All labels had been surgically removed, leaving no clue to his identity. His footwear was of the finest quality, devoid of scuffs or signs of wear. Even more perplexing was the presence of an unlit cigarette hanging behind his ear, as if he had been interrupted mid-smoke. The arrival of authorities at the scene led to an examination that would confound even the most seasoned investigators. The autopsy conducted on the unidentified man revealed no traces of violence, poison, or any obvious cause of death. His pupils were curiously constricted, hinting at the possibility of poison ingestion, yet no poison could be detected in his system. 
His overall physical condition appeared to be robust, adding a layer of mystique to the baffling case. Amidst the absence of clues, a tantalizing lead emerged. A small scrap of paper was discovered hidden in an obscure pocket of the man's trousers. The paper bore a single phrase, Tamam should. This cryptic phrase was found to be Persian, translated to ended or finished. It was a line from a book titled The Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. The discovery led investigators to a copy of the book found in an abandoned car near the beach, within which a perplexing coded message was concealed. The plot thickened when investigators uncovered a telephone number belonging to a mysterious woman scribbled on a concealed page of the book. This number eventually led them to a nurse named Jessica Thompson. Initially, she vehemently denied any knowledge of the deceased man, but her behavior raised suspicions. Ultimately, she confessed to owning a copy of the same book, but denied any connection to the Somerton man. As the years rolled on, a plethora of theories and conspiracies took root. Some speculated that the Somerton man was a spy embroiled in a web of espionage, while others contended that he had succumbed to natural causes or was entangled in a complex love affair. The backdrop of the Cold War era fueled suspicions of international intrigue. Nevertheless, the case remained unsolved, and the true identity of the Somerton man continued to elude investigators and amateur sleuths alike. The tale of the Somerton man represents a baffling enigma that has persisted for over seven decades. Despite relentless investigations and the tireless curiosity of amateur sleuths, the identity of the man and the circumstances of his death remain cloaked in mystery. The coded message, the enigmatic woman, the conspicuous absence of concrete evidence continue to tantalize those who seek to unravel the secrets hidden beneath the sands of Somerton Beach. Until the day the riddle is deciphered, the Somerton Man shall remain a timeless symbol of the unknown within the realm of true crime. I have been homeless for a while, not helpless, nor without a home. I won't get into it because it serves no purpose to the story. I sleep under the stars every night, and I do not mind the mist and the overcast weather in the morning. I find it easy to rise. The light is not too overbearing as it breaches my eyelids. There is no heat, nor is there cold. The birds and the frogs and the crickets are the first sounds in the morning, and I find no equal. In the extremity of events since I have chosen this lifestyle, there have been some events that stand out, some more than others. Time is precious, however, and it would be best if I summarized this story now, as quickly and concisely as possible. Sleeping with the elements leads to many different outcomes, I must say. Whether or not I choose to, I wake up every single day at 3.30 in the early morning. This is what I believe is considered the witching hour. For the most part, it is silent and statuesque. There was one time where I awoke face to face with a raccoon peering back at me. We were both close enough to kiss each other's noses. I jumped up in a flurry and the raccoon scampered off. Still, it sent me into conniptions. Stories about raccoons are just child's play, as far as I'm concerned. One night not too long ago, about three to five weeks ago, I woke up at the witching hour like I typically do and rolled onto my back to peer into the black web of sky that entangled the stars within it. Harassing the sky, like a trickle of rainwater blemishes the integrity of a window pane. A silver of light bolted across the sky. It was blurry, 
and it was dim. To look upon it was as if to try to see something behind a wall of dark, black ice. I really didn't get a good look at it because it moved so fast. The dim shooting star molested the carpet of stars amidst it and pierced the night unquestioningly, tearing the beautiful array of cosmos through and through. I peered further into the dark to see the stars and found myself dumbfounded and intrigued and stone still. All was silent, and at this point in time, all was lost. I deemed that there was no more credence to give the occasion, since all that passed had lasted a mere fifteen seconds, and no alarms were raised, so to speak. I closed my eyes again, rolled over, and focused on keeping my eyes closed, on breathing, and the position of my body. I am not vulnerable, I told myself with as much confidence as I could muster. After not too long, my body relaxed, my mind submitted, and once again I felt my body giving in to the necessities and allowing me to sleep once again for a few more hours. Then I woke up. Again. It seemed as if no time had passed at all. The air was just as solid. The sounds were silent, muted, morphed into oblivion and I was the only one awake in this solitary world. I just can't get into my dreams now, or that would take a novel, but I will say this much. After lucid dreaming for a decade and a half, I know the difference. This was no dream. I was most surely awake. Very awake. On edge. Yet it was so serene and tranquil there was no justification to be askew. As my eyes peered to my left and my right, laying on my side, the most untypical thing happened to me. To this very moment, I will never be able to completely describe it. The best I can do for you is to describe it as thus. Take two tubas and have them attempt to hit a middle C, and then have a few more French horns join in only they are going to octave above, and all of them are slightly out of tune with each other. It was definitely a chord of some sort. The difference being to a human being is, this did not sound brassy. It sounded more metallic, if that makes sense. It was as if the tubas and French horns were not real. More realistically, it was a replication. That's the best way I could describe it. To me, it sounded like the tuba was a middle C, and the French horns were an octave above, and they struggled to linger on this note. At first, I thought something similar to, what is that? Perhaps the folks down the way were having a party, and they wanted to raise the roof with a good song. Bad song to pick. It was just one long, breathing, heavy note that seemingly came from nowhere. But then, at five minutes or so, there was silence once again. And then, the notes shifted up half a note up the staff, lingering ever so present, and then faded out again. Odd, I said to myself. I closed my eyes again, delving deep into the idea I had a vivid imagination. But then it started again these slow notes, just two notes, wavering in the sky above, like an out-of-tune rusty squeeze box, and loud, gargantuanly loud. The reverberation was maddening, as it shook the concrete underneath me as I lay there, defenseless. That moment right there, all that happening, there really wasn't much I could do, it didn't make very much sense to me, and I was rather sure I had just been imagining things. After another ten minutes or so, the attempted melody picked up once again, and repeated itself through and through, while I just lay there thinking to myself, Man, what is that? 
the strange melody from the Milky Way disappeared as discreetly as it had appeared, and there was no more. I had never heard it before, and I certainly have not heard it since. I haven't the slightest clue what that song from the sky may have been. It lasted no more than 20 minutes, and nothing worth writing home about happened. Being slightly out of the ordinary, however, it had my mind wandering and wondering and confused and convoluted about what had exactly transpired out on the misty night as I laid alone upon the grass. One night out with some friends, I was dared to go inside of a local abandoned house. Everyone from my school knew about this house. Being a young teenager, I said sure. I approached cautiously, stepped into the decrepit house, its creaking floorboards echoing through the dimly lit hallways. I ventured deeper. A chilling breeze whispered through the broken windows, sending shivers down my spine. Shadows danced on the peeling wallpaper, playing tricks on my imagination. A sense of foreboding gripped me as I entered the living room. The air grew heavy with an unsettling silence, broken only by the sound of my own heartbeat. Something wasn't right. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I made my way up the stairs, each step groaning beneath my weight. The musty scent of decay lingered in the air, mingling with the scent of fear. The hallway above seemed to stretch endlessly, its darkness swallowing the feeble light of my flashlight. As I tiptoed further, across from me stood a large old wooden door. Against my better judgment, curiosity propelled me towards it. I pushed it open, revealing a room frozen in time. Dust-covered furniture and faded photographs lined the walls. But it was the mirror that caught my attention. Its surface was stained and cracked, reflecting a distorted version of myself. As I stared into its depths, I felt a presence behind me. I spun around, but there was nothing there. The room was empty, yet the feeling of being watched intensified. Panic welled up within me as I realized that I was not alone in this house. Whispers filled the air, slightly faint and muffled. I strained to listen, my heart pounding in my ears. The voices grew louder, their chilling words crawling under my skin. In a desperate attempt to escape, I turned to run but the door slammed shut, trapping me within the room. The whispers became screams, echoing through the house, tormenting my mind. Shadows writhed and twisted, merging into a grotesque figure that advanced towards me. Fear consumed me as I realized I had stumbled into a realm of darkness beyond comprehension. It was a place where nightmares took form, where the line between reality and the supernatural blurred. As the dark figure closed in, a cold grip tightened around my throat, choking the life out of me. It was at this moment my eyes opened, only to realize it was all a dream. When I was five, me, my mother, and sister moved for the first time. My mother had divorced my father and decided to live someplace nicer, as she called it. After a 30-minute drive, we ended up in another town. We got settled in the house and started adjusting to our new life. The first weird thing I noticed in the house was the energy. 
There was just this off feeling to it, like something would be watching your every move. I would always quickly run upstairs when I would get ready for bed in order to not feel too scared before I would sleep. After a few weeks, at the bottom of the wall, there was this weird face painted. It was no bigger than 1.5 inches, but it looked really off. The next day I told my mother, and she said she had no idea where it was coming from. Even my stepdad didn't know, but no one ever dared to remove it. A few months later, me and my sister had our second encounter. We were laying in bed in our shared room while we were both trying to get rest. In the distance, we heard some weird sounds. My sister, being the curious one, went up to the door and opened it slightly. The noise had gotten louder as she stood there, listening. Eventually, she closed the door as she turned to my bed. There's a toy in the attic going off, she said. My sister was not scared easily, but I could tell she was getting nervous. We eventually saw the light turn on and heard our mother come upstairs. She went to the attic and the sound stopped. My sister laid back in bed and our mother actually got angry with us, assuming that we had gotten out of bed and secretly continued playing. The third encounter I experienced was by myself. I was laying in bed as it was a school night and because my sister was older, she had the privilege to go to bed later. My room had been really cold, despite the thick comforter and blanket I had draped over my body. I remember being in a light sleep before my eyes shot open. I had felt something hold my left hand softly, but my left side was the wall side, meaning no one could have been there. There was also no toys or stuffed animals that I could blame. I stayed up until my sister got upstairs to go to sleep. The energy in the house seemed to have shifted the last years of our stay. Our usual nice and funny stepfather had changed into an angry, narcissistic man, doing everything to make our lives miserable. And our neighbor, who loved kids and was always happy, started to become creepy, staring out the window whenever we would play outside. She started complaining about us being too loud, while we never slammed any doors or screamed inside the house. She even tried to attack my mother once with a broom. Our mother was less happy as well. Eventually it all became too much and my mother and stepfather broke up. We started living somewhere else, and everything seemed to instantly become better. We were happier and there were no weird, unexplainable things happening. When I went to high school, I started becoming best friends with this girl. I knew her from my childhood because we actually lived on the same street. She lived eight houses down, but I never actually played with her at home when I was younger. When we were in high school, though, we started hanging outside and inside. She was home alone often, living with a teen brother and a little sister and her mother. Her mother had two jobs, so she was barely home when we got out of school. When we grew closer, we started opening up about our pasts. She admitted that her father was a narc, an alcoholic, and had anger issues. He came by their house every once in a while to bring home her youngest sister from school. Then he would eat with them and leave when her mother would come home. My friend also started opening up by the weird things that were happening in her house. Eventually, she also told me that this wasn't the first house that they had had these experiences. Before me and my family moved there, my best friend had lived somewhere else, about five minutes from their current place. She told me that there was an off vibe in the house, and her mother actually invited a medium to look at it. My friend told me that when the medium arrived, she stepped in the hallway and had all the color drained from her face. She refused to go further in the house and left. After some digging, they had actually found out that there used to be a farm where the houses were standing, and there had been an accident. Children were supposedly playing on the land, 
and the farmer had not noticed them in time, running them over with the agriculture equipment. I honestly was freaked out by this, but nothing ever happened to me in that house, so I didn't refrain myself from coming there. Wrong decision. The day this following situation all went down, started calmly. Me and my friend had actually gotten out of school early, so we decided to go to her house and watch American Horror Story, upstairs. We got into the house and locked the doors behind us, heading into the living room where we hung out and ate something, listening to the radio. When we were ready, we went upstairs, putting on the show. After about two episodes, we heard the radio being turned up from downstairs. We both looked at each other, completely terrified. We were basically trapped upstairs, as there was no safe way down from the house. My friend tried to convince me and herself that it was probably just her father trying to scare us. However, the music had not gotten turned down. I grabbed a blow dryer and made my way towards the hallway. My friend followed with a coat rack hanger. We slowly went downstairs, and I remember I was sweating bollocks. When we were almost down the stairs, I stopped in my tracks. Till this day, I don't know why. My body just would not move. Like an instinct. After about ten seconds, the downstairs hallway door was thrown closed. We both stood there in shock, not knowing what to do. My friend had forgotten her key in the living room, so we couldn't go through the front door. All of a sudden, an anger came washing over me. What the heck does this thing think it is? I thought as the rage built up inside me. I stormed down the stairs, throwing open the door. The music from the radio was so loud, it rang in my ears. When I was almost at the radio, I couldn't even hear the music anymore. As the adrenaline was beeping in my ears, the world around me was spinning, almost like I had to physically fight whatever was doing this to us. I turned off the radio, and there was a deafening sound of silence. My friend had chased behind me, looking at me with big eyes. After a moment, I felt like I could breathe again. We were both standing frozen in our spots, and eventually I told my best friend to check the doors. She nodded, hurrying to the front door, as I hurried to the back. They were both locked. Her key was still sitting on the dining room table where she left it. My friend then quickly hurried upstairs, checking if her brother was there. He wasn't. We went upstairs to grab our stuff and then stayed downstairs, trying to calm down from the situation. My friend texted me later on, saying... Her father and her brother had gotten home an hour later, both not knowing what she was talking about. We didn't hang out in her house for a good two months after that, only slowly introducing the idea when it was raining outside. I don't know what is wrong with this neighborhood, but it is not natural. I live in southern Ontario, just off the north shore of Lake Erie in farm country. Nobody who still lives here can say it's the best place on earth to live. It's small, quiet, and everything is far away. There aren't many jobs there, and if you want to stay there, your best bet is to pick a trade and commute to the nearest city. Although life here is kind of lackluster, I've always cherished those quiet drives through the Norfolk County countryside especially on an autumn night as the sun sets, shining low and casting its final light over the picturesque landscape. The roads wind through fields of golden corn, dotted with woodlots of pine trees, and lined with rich thickets of sumac that line the route seem to whisper secrets to the colors in the sundering skies. One night I decided to take one of my late night commutes. The air was crisp, 
and the harvest moon cast this eerie, silver glow over the fields of corn and the trees that lined the road. I knew these roads well, every twist and turn like the back of my hand. When we were younger, we would bike up and down the concessions and in and out of the trails passing through the nearby conservation land, sometimes even walking it. We would often lock our bikes up to the trees alongside the road and hike into the forest and walk among the trees, trudging through thickets of brush and burdock, only to come out covered in burrs and mud. You could spend all day and night out there without a worry. There are no predators here aside from the odd coyote, and they aren't likely to come near you in groups. We have lots of animals, sure. Foxes, badgers, lynx, possum, but nothing big. Nothing that is very likely to pose a threat walking out in the woods. In fact, out here, you are far more likely to be mistaken for a deer by a hunter than you are to be attacked by an animal. We have no bears, no wolves, the odd mention of cougars, but these accounts are rare and heavily contested or given little thought. Even then, you would never see one even if they were here. On one particular night, I found myself with downtime. I had the next four days off, and I had just settled into a house to myself. My brother had moved away to Toronto a couple of months earlier, and my parents were away for the weekend. My plans for this weekend were to have no plans. I was just going to chill on my own, buy a bunch of snacks, and bask in the cool darkness of the basement and play Diablo. I had everything I needed at home, but I had elected to make a snack run and get some chips, pop, and maybe some ice cream from the grocery store in town. We lived out in the country, north of a small hamlet called Vanessa. The nearest grocery store was in Waterford, south of us by a few minutes drive. It's a nice drive into town if you take the back roads, and that was my plan. The roads were thick on either side with a tall, ancient canopy of trees, light breaking through the tops of the trees to illuminate the road in golden stained glass, layers of green fading into the deep shadows of the canopy. The lowering light of the sun at this time shows just how immense these particular woods are. A never-ending sprawl of fallen leaves and mud lined with fiddlehead ferns and skunk cabbage fenced in by the trees along the roadside. On my way back from the grocery store, as I was heading down one of the more remote stretches of road, something in the distance caught my eye. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light. It seemed to race along behind me in the trees as I drove down the forested road. Upon further inspection, it seemed to be running on all fours, and it was starting to catch up to me. It moved with a sort of unsettling grace, as if it were on the hunt. As it got closer, my heart started to race as it began to overtake me. As it jumped out in front of me, I slammed on the brakes and sent myself forward in my seat. Looking up, it was about ten feet away from me, upright in the middle of the now moonlit road. There was no denying it. I was looking at a creature. A creature that should have only existed in stories. This thing was massive, hulking, and covered in matted fur. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My eyes locked onto this creature. It seemed so out of place in our world. It looked like a big black dog, but it was upright on its hind legs like a dog, and had wide paws with opposable thumbs. They looked more like a human hand with long, sharp claws. Gray like an elephant's hide, covered with fur among massive forearms. At first glance, it looked a little like a primate, were it not for a wiry canine tail and a snarling snout laden with countless sharp, wolfish teeth. It stared with a bloodthirsty ferocity I have never encountered in my life up to this point, and never again since then. 
and gave a deep, booming growl that overtook all sound in the now still-standing wilderness along the silent country road. I didn't even perceive the music that I had on at the time. Nothing really registered aside from the horror I was witnessing ahead of me on the road. The moonlight revealed its eyes, which glowed with an unnatural amber light. It had a snout full of sharp, glistening teeth. Fear surged through me, but I could not tear my gaze away. The world felt suspended in that moment, like everything else had disappeared. And then, the impossible happened. The creature turned its head to look at me. Our eyes met, and a wave of terror washed over me, primal and raw. I was sure I was done for, that this thing was going to leap at me. Every bone in my body was frozen as time and space stood still. My blood froze as I awaited what was sure to be my doom. I was locked in place. I know what you're thinking. You're in a car. Why didn't you just hit the gas? But I just couldn't will my foot into action. There are three human reactions to exterior threats. Fight, flight, and freeze. And I guess in that moment my body chose to freeze. But then the unmistakable flash of high beams from a distant truck, now speeding towards us, broke the tension, and the thing reacted, lifting its snout up in the air and sniffing as it turned to see the oncoming truck. As suddenly as it had appeared, the creature turned away and bounded off into the night, vanishing into the shadows of the trees. I could not believe my luck. Awestruck and still shaken up by what I had just seen, I sat there in the road still struggling to come back to reality. As the truck approached, it slowed to a stop before it passed me, and the driver got out, apparently thinking something was the matter as I was parked in the middle of a concession at this point, just sitting there. Kid, hey, kid, are you all right? The man shouted out from just outside of his driver's side door. I jerked up and nodded at him. I tried to pull myself together as he walked up to my window, and I rolled it down and looked out to him. You good? Should you be driving? The man clearly thought I was drunk, or maybe too stoned and couldn't drive. I mean, I don't blame him. What am I supposed to say? I just saw a werewolf? I told him I was fine and that yes, I could drive. I quickly made it up that my engine had stalled and I just got in after fixing it and he nodded and got back in his truck, heading on his way down the road and out of sight. As soon as I got in, I tried my best to shake it off, quickly get my head together, and I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, putting as much distance between me and that terrifying encounter as I could. I drove back home that night, shaken to my core. I couldn't stop thinking about what I had seen. Norfolk County had always been a place of beauty and tranquility for me, but that night, I had come face to face with something I have since never been able to come to terms with. Something straight out of some German fairy tale from Grimm. When I got home, I hit the desk straight away and started looking up anything I could find that even remotely described what I saw. The closest thing I could find was a reference to something called the Loop Guru, or Werewolf, of Quebec City but I couldn't find anything about anything of the sort in Ontario. I still can't explain what happened that night, and even now, most people don't believe me. But for me, the memory of that encounter with whatever was stalking cars in the middle of the country will always be etched in my mind. A chilling reminder that sometimes there are things we cannot explain, or just are not ready to try explaining that there is more to this world than perhaps we know, and that maybe, just maybe, something, maybe even someone, is lurking out in the woods of Ontario, that for better or for worse, we will never discover.
I have always had a morbid curiosity. From true crime podcasts to documentaries to books and spending hours online looking up killers, both infamous and obscure. In fact, when I was in the fifth grade, my parents had to come in and talk to the teacher when I told the class about the body farms the FBI uses to teach future agents to identify how long corpses have been dead for. I devoured this kind of stuff and still do, but it wasn't until I met Matt, my roommate at college, that this hobby was taken up a notch. Like me, Matt was into the same things, only his parents were rich and gave him enough money so that he could go on what he called death tours, where he could go see where murderers lived, where they worked, and even to the sites of their grisly murders. And since I was his friend and into the same things as he was, he would pay for my ticket and bring me along. The first place we went was where H.H. Holmes' murder castle once stood. Since it was no longer there, we both thought this was a bit of a letdown. A shame, too, because he was my favorite serial killer. Lots of people look at me odd for claiming I have a favorite serial killer, or when I explain that I love true crime and all its gory details. It's not like I am dangerous or anything, I just want to know how someone could go ahead and actually kill someone. Everyone has thought about it, but to actually go ahead and do it is, well, that's what I find fascinating. The summer break before our senior year, we decided to take off to Arizona to explore where Mateo Salazar hunted for nearly 20 years before he was caught and executed. When Matt suggested this destination, I didn't know who Mateo Salazar was, so Matt showed me his stats. All the people that he killed, how long he was active, etc. His crimes were so gruesome that I was surprised that I had never heard of him. He would abduct people, give them strange tattoos before skinning them alive, and then kill them. No one knows why he skinned people he forced tattoos on, but it's suspected that it was part of a strange and twisted religious ritual. Also, the exact number of people that he murdered is a topic of contention, but it is anywhere between 35 and 50. Shortly after he was caught, the area he hunted in became a ghost town. Not just because no one wanted to live in a place where that many murders happened, but because it was so isolated that there were no jobs to keep people around. Since then, it became a sort of grim tourist attraction, dedicated to the man who killed so many. When we got there, I expected to see a tour guide, but other than the dust being kicked up by the wind and the abandoned buildings, there was very little to see. I would have thought that there would have been at least someone in the gift shop, which was the former post office, but that too was empty. Most of the things in the small and dust-covered gift shop were knickknacks and not interesting to either Matt or I. However, there was one thing that caused a cold shiver to creep up my spine. Under a glass counter was Mateo Salazar's death mask, taken shortly after his execution. Beneath it were the last words he spoke, and when I read them it sounded more like a curse. My work is not finished. It will never be finished. I'll be back. Matt was not bothered by this, but for some reason that I cannot articulate, I was. I had to leave, but instead of telling Matt the mask made me feel uneasy, he would have teased me if I did. I just told him I'm going off to explore, which was true. All over town there were plaques. Some gave a brief history of a building, and others were about the people who lived or worked there. Most of them were either Salazar's victims or friends who were oblivious to the horrible things that he did when he was alive. Like always, I took tons of pictures while Matt ran off to do his own thing. In hindsight, I wish I had followed him around. Maybe things would have been different if I had. After a few hours had passed, I realized that I hadn't seen him around for a long time. 
It wasn't like the town was large enough to get lost in. In an hour, I had been down every major road, and after two hours, I saw mostly everything the town had to offer. Yet, there was no sign of Matt, or anyone else. I wondered if this was one of his tricks, like he was going to jump out and try to scare me or something. If you know Matt, you would know that this would not have been a surprise. However, if he was going to jump out and scare me, he was displaying an uncharacteristically amount of patience, because I hadn't seen any sign of him since leaving the gift shop. I called out to Matt after seeing all I could in that ghost town, but there was no reply. It's hard to explain how it felt having an entire town to myself. The best word I can come up with is eerie, but that falls short. Thankfully, Matt didn't jump out to scare me, but the look on his face hinted that he did something he should not have done, but I was too scared and cranky from walking all day to ask him about it. Driving back to the hotel, Matt asked me what I thought of the town, and I told him that I was sort of let down by it. I was hoping that there was more to see, at least a tour guide that could have told us what the internet couldn't. I assumed that Matt wouldn't have been disappointed with my opinion, but it didn't bother him. After a long moment, I turned to look at him and saw a smile that did little to hide some mischievous deed. I asked what he did, but instead of answering, he said he would rather show me when we get back to the hotel, and I knew I was not going to like what he would say. Back at the hotel, he opened up the backpack that he had with him all day, and pulled out the death mask of Mateo Salazar. He had stolen it from the gift shop. With a smile, he said he was going to hang it up on the wall back at the dorm. Needless to say, I was upset about this, even more so when he said it was all right, because he looked and there were no cameras, as if I was mad that he might get caught and not because he stole something. I was tired and I didn't want to fight. It wasn't like it would have done either of us any favors if I did, so I decided to drink at the hotel bar for the remainder of the night. When we got back to the dorms, Matt stayed true to his word and hung up the death mask on the living room wall. There, it served as an interesting conversation piece when we had guests. It didn't take long before our guests claimed that they were getting a weird feeling from it. When asked about it, they said it wasn't so much as the feeling of being watched, which was also the case, but more like it was radiating evil. At first, we considered this nonsense. No one had that feeling before we told them about its origins, so we chalked it up as the placebo effect. In truth, though, sometimes it gave me the creeps. I, too, would get the feeling of someone watching me when I was alone. In the weeks that followed, I would be doing something for class, reading a book or researching something online, and in the corner of my eye, I could have sworn that its eyes were open. However, every time I looked, its eyes were shut. I told myself it was the trick of the light, my imagination, or that I should take it easy with the edibles. However, none of that explained how Matt's behavior changed. He started missing classes. He stayed out all night and hardly spoke to me. I should have done something, but at the time, the only thing I could think of was talking to his parents. Sometimes, when he thought I was asleep in my room, I could hear Matt talking to himself. One night, I spied on him and discovered that he was actually talking to the death mask. I needed a break from this and decided to go to a party. I didn't go with Matt. Not because of how much he changed, but because parties were never his scene. So I was a little surprised to see him standing in the corner looking at everyone at the party. The way he was looking at people wasn't like his usual self. It wasn't like he was trying to build up the nerves to talk to a girl that caught his eye. It reminded me of the way a reptile looked at something, cold and unfeeling eyes calculating to decide if it was worth the effort to go after. Coming up with an excuse not to return to the dorm room was a no-brainer. 
I needed a break from Matt. So that night, I slept at my girlfriend's house. The next morning, I was reluctant to return. But when I did, I saw police cars in the parking lot and on the grass next to the doors. People were crying and holding each other. When I asked what happened, they told me my roommate killed a girl while I was gone. I refused to believe it, but then someone showed me a video on their phone of the police marching Matt out of the dorms as he was laughing. The police interviewed me, and I cooperated to the best of my ability. They didn't ask about Mateo Salazar's death mask, so I never mentioned it. After a few hours of interrogation, I was free to go, but I was warned not to leave town. The people in the dorms treated me like a leper and kept away from me. Not surprising. After all, it wasn't a secret that the two of us had the same interests, and it was only natural to assume that I was involved with the murders too. The details of Matt's crimes came out over the next few days, and to me they sounded exactly like Mateo Salazar's. He abducted three people, two girls and a guy, and killed them. Rumor was he also gave them tattoos and skinned them. I couldn't help but to think of Salazar's death mask. If I wasn't already freaked out by it, hearing the details of Matt's crimes was the straw that broke the camel's back, and I decided to get rid of it. However, before I could throw it in the trash, someone knocked on the door. When I answered it, I was surprised and confused to see two people who didn't look like they were police or FBI. Not only were they hairless, but they also had bright orange coveralls. After asking who they were and what they wanted, the shorter of the two answered in a monotone voice and said they just wanted the mask. I would have given it to them for free, but they pulled out a checkbook and asked me to name my price. When I said the number, I thought they would haggle me, but they didn't blink and wrote out the check. Surprised at this sudden windfall of money, I didn't say or do anything to stop them when they let themselves in and took the mask off the wall. They left without a word after taking the mask, and I watched them depart down the hallway. On the back of their coveralls was the same name on the check. The Catadesmos Museum. Okay, so what I'm about to tell you is completely true. About seven years ago, both me and my girlfriend were on the run together. We had both gotten in trouble and decided to catch a greyhound from North Carolina to Missouri to stay with some friends. To make a long story shorter, we ended up in Springfield, Missouri, and rented a house with a buddy of mine named Stoney. The house we moved into ended up being a very creepy place. Me and my girlfriend could both feel something wrong about it, and we told Stoney that we thought it might be haunted. He wasn't the type to believe in the paranormal, and for the most part, I wasn't either, until a few days down the road. Me and my girlfriend had to leave for the weekend and wouldn't return until the following Tuesday. When we finally got back to the house, Stoney was sitting on the front porch, looking really freaked out and dismayed. I asked him what was going on, and he replied, You guys were right. Something isn't right about this place. He wouldn't specify what he meant, but it was clear to see that something had scared the crap out of him. My buddy wasn't a cupcake either. He was a tough little dude who wasn't really scared of anything. He had even broken out of jail before, but he refused to go back in that house unless we were in there with him. We ended up moving our mattress into his room because he didn't want to sleep alone. It was a rainy day outside, and I was off of work, so I decided to rent a couple of movies. We pulled our mattress beside Stoney's and turned on the TV. Stoney randomly asked if we would pray with him, so we all stood in the center of the room and said a prayer. While he was praying, I was overtaken by this terrible feeling. 
It almost felt like we were upsetting something by praying. As I backed away, I started to feel really weird and dizzy, so I got in the bed and laid my head in my girl's lap. I slipped into tunnel vision and was paralyzed for the next couple of minutes, hearing voices. There was a very deep, pulverizing voice that scared me to the core, talking to what I perceived to be a human female. The deeper voice was not a regular human. It almost sounded metallic in a way, for lack of better description. I remember it bragging about how it had been around forever, and that it was immortal. It said that humans were stupid beasts, and did not deserve to live. I remember it specifically saying that we were poisoning ourselves, for some reason. The female voice asked, Should we take him now? And the other voice said, No, he's killing himself, and we'll see him soon enough. I started thinking to myself, Is this thing talking about me? Do they know that I can hear them? The very moment I had this thought, they began saying things that were specifically about me. They were naming all of these bad things that would happen to me in the future, while seemingly getting off on my fear at the same time. They said my girl would leave me, and I would end up alone and in prison, where I would be repeatedly assaulted and stabbed. The way they were laughing about these things was truly evil and disturbing. They were literally getting off on my fear. It was a bloodthirsty evil that I can't even put into words. For the two to three minutes this was going on, I couldn't move a muscle. I wanted to get my girl's attention, but I could not move my finger to even scratch her leg. Then, all of a sudden, the voices stopped and I could move again. As soon as my girl saw my face, she could tell something was terribly wrong. For the next week, I was shook up and ended up spending a lot of time on the porch with Stoney, until we all moved out of that house. Before you judge me, just know that I wasn't on anything. I have never suffered from any kind of mental illness, and I have never heard voices before or after that day. People try to tell me it was sleep paralysis, but I never closed my eyes or dozed off at any point in time. Regardless of what anyone may think, I know that what I heard that day was demons. I want people to know that true evil is real, and not just an imaginary thing that we humans use to blame all of our flaws on. I use this day to remind me that true evil exists, and to keep me in check and on the right path. When I remember the reality of what happened and the sound of that voice, it still shakes me. I hope that none of you guys ever have to encounter what I did that day. Just take my word for it. In the picturesque landscape of the Sierra Nevada mountains, the Ketty Resort stood as an oasis of tranquility. Cabin 28, a rustic yet charming abode, was the residence of the Sharp family. Sue Sharp, a devoted mother, her two children, Dana and John, and their friend Dana Wingate. The year was 1981, and Ketty was the epitome of a peaceful haven a place where city dwellers sought refuge from their hectic lives. On the crisp morning of April 12, 1981, the peacefulness of Ketty was shattered by the return of Sheila Sharp, Sue's teenage daughter from a neighbor's sleepover. The sight that greeted her inside Cabin 28 was nothing short of a nightmare. Her mother, her brother, and their friend Dana Wingate lay dead, bound, and brutally bludgeoned. The cabin was a scene of unimaginable violence, and Sheila fled in terror to seek help from the resort's management. Law enforcement arrived promptly, and the investigation into the Ketty Cabin murders was launched. The crime scene was chaotic, with potential evidence strewn across the cabin. 
It was evident that this was no random act of violence as the other children sleeping in the adjacent bedrooms remained unharmed. Suspicion quickly turned to Marty Smart, Sue Sharp's ex-husband, and his acquaintance Bo Bubid, who had been spotted around the resort on the night of the murders. Marty's wife Marilyn had joined them for part of the evening, but insisted that she left before the violence erupted. Both Marty and Bo had criminal records and a history of violent behavior. The investigation into the Keddie Cabin murders was filled with twists and turns. Several leads were pursued, including potential connections to local drug dealers and organized crime. But the case eventually grew cold. The murders remained an enigma, haunting the memories of those who had been touched by the tragedy. In 2016, a glimmer of hope emerged when new evidence, including DNA, was unearthed. This development led to the arrest of three suspects, Marilyn Smart, her brother Dana Wingate, and John Sharp's classmate, Justin. Justin, a mere child at the time of the murders, was believed to have witnessed the horrifying events. The cases against Marilyn Smart and Dana Wingate were subsequently dropped due to alibis that placed them away from the scene on the night of the murders. Tragically, Justin had taken his own life in 1982, and the justice for the Sharp family remained elusive. The Keddie Cabin murders remain a haunting and unsolved chapter in true crime history. Despite the emergence of new evidence and suspects, justice for the Sharp family remains an unfulfilled promise. The shadows cast by the Sierra Nevada Pines continue to guard their secrets and the legacy of the Keddie Cabin murders leaves an indelible mark on Keddie Resort, forever etching a chilling tale in the annals of the resort's history.